uh, morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the Ethics, Fairness, and Fairness on the Web panel. Um, we have I have with me uh, distinguished panelists. So first, uh, Gina Matthews is a professor of computer science at Clarkson University. Uh, she is uh, representing North America and the academic world. Then I have Anisha Talagala, the CEO and, and founder. Sorry. <laughs> So the CEO and founder of the AI Club World. And finally, I, I have uh, with us uh, Gregor Strojin, which is the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence at the Council of Europe. And, and very important, the Council of Europe is not the European Union, just in case you are asking about the regulation that was published yesterday by the European Union, or the proposed regulation. So uh, I will start by, by uh, a bit of disclosing your background for the for the audience. So uh, we'll start with you, Nisha. So Nisha, you are representing also um, the industry world. You are now in California, but you are from Sri Lanka. So you also represent Asia and you live six years in Nigeria. So maybe a little bit of Africa. And I'm representing here Latin America. So we have like a wide representation of the world. Um, can you tell us if you have seen uh, important cultural differences between all these places you, you have been respect to the topic we're talking, especially ethics, because ethics is not something that is global. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, so um, no, actually, it's, it's a very good question. I think that, you know, in my in my most recent sort of role at, at AI Club, one of the things that I'm doing is broad based sort of AI literacy and improving AI education kind of across the world. And in that context, I've definitely seen what you're referring to. I think the perspective about AI ethics is very different across different parts of the world. And some of it has to do with sort of what they've heard. There's a lot of things on the news that are both positive and negative. And so if you are you know, not sort of aware or in the middle of an AI development, then you tend to, your view of it tends to come from the news. And you sometimes can have the perspective that either it can solve of all problems or it is the source of you know many problems so there's definitely you know and, and when i kind of even across north america i definitely see this perspective of if you're sort of more in the technology domain you tend to be um more positive towards it possibly aware of the ethics issues but maybe not so, so concerned whereas if you are you know not so much in the technology domain then there's definitely a fear if you will and the fear is of that the, of, of a violation of privacy you know, concerns about bias, concerns about primarily kind of um, not being able to understand the technology and understanding kind of, it's it's a bit mysterious and it's a bit uh, kind of concerning as to what it might be capable of. Hope that answers your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Nisha. Let me continue with, with Gregor. So Gregor represents Europe and also represents, uh, in some sense, government. Um, maybe you can tell us what is the relation on on for example what the council of europe has done rela related to to the new uh, eu regulation so did you have some input for that uh, what is your opinion of what was published yesterday anything that that could help our audience to understand the context of the new new proposal thank you ricardo uh, hello first of all Indeed, I come from uh, Slovenia and I would like to thank the organizers who are also from Slovenia for inviting me. But uh, as Ricardo said, I'm also here representing the Council of Europe and the Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence, which was founded, uh, established two years ago with the goal of um, developing first a feasibility study on design, development and application of um, human rights, rule of law and democracy standards to uh, in AI and to see what would be the necessary elements of such a legal framework. The idea is to create the building blocks for a potential convention or a treaty which would uh, guide the design, development and application of AI. And uh, Council of Europe has traditionally been uh, an organization in charge of human rights issues. It has 47 member countries, so it's wider than the European Union. 
It um, also includes uh, the countries such as the such as Russian Federation and some other uh, countries from Eurasia, and it has more than 830 million people. It includes all the countries of the European Union, by the way. And uh, a while ago, we had a meeting um, at the OECD, I think, where we found a very nice way to describe the um, approaches or the mandates of different organizations that are currently dealing with uh, AI. So if Council of Europe is primarily concerned with human rights, OECD is concerned with uh, technology and economy. Uh, UNESCO is concerned with culture, education and science. NATO, for example, with warfare. The European Union is concerned with uh, safety, security and the market. So it's more oriented toward uh, functioning of the so-called internal market. And traditionally, the global standard setters, such as the GDPR or uh, cooperation in criminal and law enforcement matters, which were um, in, detailed, in details um, developed or uh, implemented by the EU European Union countries, such cooperation was based on the treaties which were previously developed by the Council of Europe. So GDPR did, uh, was formed uh, four years ago, but it has a background in uh, Convention 108 and Convention 108 Plus, which were developed in the 80s. And a couple of years ago, it was 108 Plus, uh, which were developed by the Council of Europe for precisely the reason of finding a common treaty for data protection. Similarly, um, cooperation in criminal uh, matters and law enforcement and cybersecurity is based on a uh, treaty called the Budapest Convention, also developed by the Council of Europe. So external non-EU countries traditionally have used the European Union instruments by ac accessing or acceding to the treaties of the European uh, of the Council of Europe. So there is this connection, but of course both organizations are independent of each other, but because they are international organizations, they consist of similar countries and they are looked at uh, their own competences from a perspective of the same countries. So this is just a short introduction about the differences between these organizations. No, no, I think this was excellent because I love the way you describe, for example, the difference between what are the goals of OECD, the UNESCO and so on, because we know all these institutions, but not always we know how they overlap and how they work together. So Gina, um, you are representing here the academic world and, and North America. Uh, and a typical issue between researchers and, and industry uh, is that, that, for example, we have less data, uh, we have access, not uh, the same access of big companies to, to the, the same issues or problems. So in your opinion, what is the way that, that academic, the academic world can help on the world of ethical AI? That's a, that's a great question. And I, my first uh, reaction to that question is to think a little bit about what's happened with the ethical AI team at Google in the last bit and the importance of having ethical AI researchers that, that are outside the reach of industry um, so that they can continue to stand up for messages that um, industry might not like delivered. Um, but I also would like to see strengthening of whistleblower protections and, and the ability to do ethical AI research in industry. There are a lot of people doing that in industry and I'm super thankful for that. Um, but the trade-off you mentioned is, is very clear. You know, Big companies have a lot of data and being able to do research on all of that data in some ways is uh, a delight, you know, a wonderful opportunity. And when you don't have access to it and you're working with narrower APIs, that is uh, concerning. Um, but I think the amount of data that industry has is a problem all on its own. You know, I, I think about the level to which we are surveilled these days. 
you know, I was just actually looking back at some slides that I had done about this space 10 years ago for, for an odd reason. And it really struck me how 10 years ago I was saying things like, I'm not sure that they care about you individually. They just want your data as an example of a larger demographic um, so that they can make large sweeping decisions about big things. And that's just hysterical. It's not true anymore. They very much want to track every single one of us like an animal in the zoo and, and know exactly everything about what we want, you know, where we've been, who we know, down to what happens in our kitchen and bathrooms and bedrooms and cars and every everything with our name associated. And that's a little frightening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. So, so uh, let me start with Gregor now. Um, uh, any, any experiential aspect, so any, any uh, interesting uh, anecdote or, or, or ethical problem in AI that you have uh, yourself suffered or, or, or worry about, or in, if you don't have that, that that's good. Uh, an example that you like that shows all the different facets of this problem to, to the audience. Well, I think we've all experienced uh, spooky moments in personal lives. Uh, for example, in the morning when uh, my phone gives me the information that I only have uh, 15 minutes with my car to the kindergarten. So a lot of information is included in that uh, notice that I get on the phone that I have a child who's going to be in this and that kindergarten and at that time. And, um, but what we are dealing with uh, the Council of Europe is uh, how to limit uh, the risks that are connected to opportunities, of course, but how to limit the risks uh, which are brought by the, not only AI, but also technology in general, but primarily AI, when they are used by the government, when they're used by the public sector. And this is often connected also to the private sector, of course. Sometimes uh, the violations of human rights uh, happen nowadays, especially in the labor market. Um, they're happening even more so in the private sector. And they are at the same time the responsibility of the state. What we're dealing with is trying to identify the um, risks and phases where these risks develop develop uh, in the design process, development process, and application process. So at various stages and by different actors, being the developers and uh, the users being uh, the state. We've seen in the, um, in the last couple of years a number of examples in um, big global uh, standard setting countries where uh, AI was used without uh, adequate precaution for very important decisions. For example, we've had decisions in the justice sector used by uh, courts uh, and uh, probation services in the United States. We've had um, AI used for social welfare and child welfare services in uh, Netherlands. Basically, we've had the, our, the first court case uh, prohibiting the use of such a system last year uh, in the Netherlands, the so-called Siri yeah. system. And, and that, that had also a political impact. Exactly. It had a it huge government, impact. Government the government uh, resigned yeah. in January this year. And we need to take into account the human fates, a human um, component connected to this, where we had tens of thousands of children who lost, or families, who lost child's benefits because of inadequate or inappropriate or wrong algorithms and decisions and this cost not only loss of money it cost breakups of families it cost tension within families so we can see how one decision 
can impact not only the financial aspect, the social welfare, welfare aspect, but also individual, fam societal, and uh, governmental sit uh, position. And um, what we need to do is set clear standards where, under what conditions, under what precautions, use of technology is allowed use of AI technology is allowed. We are not supposed to look at it on one side as a silver bullet without any critical thought given to potential negative impacts. We shouldn't look at it as snake oil. We need to know what a certain technology does, within which limitations, under what conditions, and also, if there are um, some errors that can be expected so that they can be remedied or that you have a right to appeal. In this case, in the Dutch social welfare, welfare scandal, the biggest problem was that they didn't have a right to appeal. So this was oh. this uh, landslide. Thank you, Gregor. A great example that you remind us of the Netherlands case. Um, I think that there also will like like saying what, what will be the impact in in the indirect impact in many people i think the the uk case uh, about uh, the students it was important because also something important is that these things are are, are done with good intentions like like uh, okay we had COVID, uh we had um, we can take exams let's use an algorithm but the algorithm was not uh, well designed and then the, re the result is even worse than 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 the goal of this so um, uh, let me uh, continue uh, with uh, Gina. So the same question. So, so I know you have a, a great uh, DNA example, which is not a, a typical one, but any experience on, on, on how subtle are the impact of this, uh, of this technology? So I do have some wonderful criminal justice examples, but the one I, I think what I'd like to say today, especially, is I'd like people to think about how they would feel if you hired someone to clean your house. And that person, when you weren't looking, took pictures of everything you own, every page of everything you own. They left microphones in your kitchen, in your bedroom. Um, and, and they said, you know, I think that all that information might help me to sell you some things more accurately. Well, of course. If you knew that much about me, you could, I'm sure, think of something you might be able to sell to me that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Okay, that's not too surprising. Um, and is it likely they might be able to manipulate me into doing something? Maybe guess something I still need or think of what, I'm, uh, what I might be weak to? Yes. Um, but I would not call that a savvy business strategy. I wouldn't say to that person, Congratulations, you. I think your stock price should go way up. That's just a savvy business move. I would call that theft. I would call that outrageous invasion of privacy. But we allow big web platforms to do exactly that all day long, every day. And it's spreading well beyond the web. It's spreading to our refrigerators, our cars. You can't even hardly buy a... a um, a um, like a, a Wi-Fi router that will just you know transit your packets and mind its own business. Every single thing that we're buying, you can replace the word smart with the word surveillance. Would you like a surveillance TV? Would you like a surveillance refrigerator? Would you like a surveillance car? Um, and I think we way underestimate the power of the bars we're now living in in the zoo. Um, you know, we, I think people realize they're being advertised to. And most people are like, okay, that's a little creepy, especially when like I only spoke it out loud and suddenly, you know, I'm being advertised everywhere. People realize that's creepy, but they think, ah, oh, you know, targeted advertising, that's not so bad. But it goes so far beyond that to one big decisions about our lives. You know, did you um, buy plus size clothing? Maybe your insurance rates will go up. Did you charge marriage counseling? Maybe. You know, uh, you're you know about to have a financial loss. Let's let's cut your credit limit. Things that de-incentivize healthy behavior. Mm -hmm. We've really created a situation where we are not 
um, contributing to human well-being, the health of societies, and certainly not democratic principles. And beyond um, big decisions about our lives made unfairly, we have the absolute ability to manipulate us into doing things that we don't even recognize we're being manipulated into. You know, the power of propaganda, the power of getting you the suggestion of a hamburger just when you're about to be hungry or a conspiracy theory just when you're going to be vulnerable to it. We see that around us all the time. It is destroying lives, destroying our societies. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gina. So um, that's the concern of many of us. Uh, and, and, and clearly, the, this principle of uh, proportionality on the data that you collect uh, how much time you store it, and and and, and if you really use it uh, in an ethical way, is really an issue, and I will get back to that in in, in, in later. So Nisha, the same question for you. Um, you are an entrepreneur now, uh, and and maybe you have your own experience with with um, ethical issues of AI, or maybe you have seen an interesting example that that you can share where you see the the, the different ways that this thing can impact. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that both, you know, both of the points that were made earlier are extremely valid. So I think we all have our sort of mildly comical, but ultimately dangerous kind of, you know, examples. So I had one yesterday, for example, where a device that I didn't even know was in my kitchen spoke to me. And I bought this device. I did not, you know, and, and it, I've had this device for over a year and it has never spoken to me before. And my guess is it got a firmware upgrade and now has the ability to speak. And so it took me a while to find the device and figure out, you know, where it was. But I'm guessing it's been listening to me for quite some time. Yeah. And so so that's a kind of that just happened yesterday. Uh, and you know, I don't, I'm sure we're all you know frequently being contacted by bots. And one thing I wonder about when I is that I understand enough AI that I can usually fool a bot. You know, or I can figure out when a bot is talking to me. But, you know, but what about the average person who doesn't have the level of understanding? You know, what are they? What's going to happen when a bot calls them? You know, what are they going to give this bot their social security number? It's pretending to be a friend of theirs. So, like, I had a bot who literally called me up and pretended to be someone I haven't spoken to in about two years. And for the first thirty seconds, I was super happy to hear from her until I realized I wasn't talking to her. So, I mean, so there's stuff like that going on, and certainly, I mean, this is not good. So, you know, I think that there's sort of like this. And, and on the other side, I think there is, you know, in my previous job, I worked with companies that are really trying to, you know, develop ethical and you know, good governance principles, partly to be you know, legally compliant and partly just because it's good business. And they are also finding that it's just sometimes difficult to do it inside without a tremendous amount of education. So like one scenario that happened at a bank was, you know, kind of exactly uh, similar to the, one of the examples like, Gregor mentioned is, you know, these most of these things are not ill-intentioned. You know, there's so much trouble you can get into simply by even being good, well-intentioned. Imagine the amount of trouble you'll get into if you're not well-intentioned. But, um, but essentially, you know, this idea that AIs can find their way out into the real world without enough oversight sometimes happens simply because you have an energetic data scientist who didn't realize the trouble that they were causing. And then the company's in that situation is, what am I going to do? I cannot... I have to make sure find a way that this person doesn't get themselves into trouble, but at the same time is able to do their jobs. So like one extreme was basically that they mandated that no one will access any file of data if they're going to use AI with it without approval. Then came back the question, what is AI? You know, if I do statistical analysis, am I allowed to do it? And stuff like that. And the situation promptly got ridiculous. And so, so I think one of the dilemmas here is that this, in, in order to kind of rem make it effective and possible for people to develop more ethical principles, you have to have some sort of a broad-based mechanism where an average person can appreciate what the problem is and appreciate some simple things that they can do to mitigate it. You know, And that's something that I think is just, it's not just re required for the average person who has a device in their house, it's also required for the people who build AIs and say, okay, so somewhere between I can't do anything and I can't do everything. You know, what is it that I can do that will, you know, keep everybody sort of in line? And so that I think is is one of the areas that every, you know, people are just generally struggling with. So. Thank you, Nisha. The, the, the initial example was great. Uh, may I, may I ask what the bot was saying to you? Because it's not it's not only the fact that the bot was talking, but also the what was talking. So can can we know what what? Uh, yes. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So, so, so we're talking about the bot. Yeah. So, so a bot reached out to me. Said it was my friend Anne, who I haven't spoken about to no, in no, two no, years. No, 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 no. Alicia, no, I'm talking about the, the kitchen one. So suddenly, oh, the, one the, the yeah. What, what she told me about the said to you? I'm a bot. I'm here. I'm new. Uh, new, new version or? No, no, no. So I was talking to my daughter. You know, completely unrelated. I had bought her some new flip flops. And I was telling her that I bought her some new flip flops and suddenly a bot spoke up and told me something I, I apparently needed to know about South America. You know, and I had never heard this bot before. So he picked up something in my voice that thought, you know, thought that I was talking to it, came back with some information about South America. Then my reaction was, what is this bot and where is it in my kitchen? Right. <laughs> yeah. And then it went on from there. Yes. It thought no. I had asked the question. I, it answered yeah. the question. I thought yeah, it so might say, you look so lovely today. Could I interest you in a network? Yeah. So, so this is this is great because uh, I think here the point is is awareness, awareness that you are talking to the device, and 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 this is non ethical to to basically try to deceive you that you are not talking to the device, like like your friend or or for example the device not introducing itself before talking to you in the kitchen in your kitchen, it's in your private personal space. Even that is a weird, like, like um, I don't expect someone to answer a question in the kitchen if I'm uh, speaking loudly. So let me, let me start now with, with, uh, with uh, Gina. Um, so we, I, I think we, we have different views uh, and, and, and clearly you have uh, concerns about surveillance. Um, do you have additional concerns like in, in your research or, or, or in, in general? And how we can mitigate those concerns regarding uh, trustworthy, responsible, or ethical AI? Mm. Yeah, so many concerns. I don't. It's hard to even know where to start. But there's a Number few one. things I thought. I thought, yeah, a few things I I, I I wrote down that I wanted to say today. And one is somewhat related to like a bot speaking to you in your kitchen is a little bit of a denial of service attack against our attention. So if you think of our attention landscape. You know, I, I, I used to be more of a computer security researcher in focus. I still am. Uh, and, you know, a denial of service attack takes a, a website down because it gets so many requests that it can't handle. It can't do legitimate things. And I think in a lot of ways that happens to our attention. And um, I used to think that the answer to bad speech, lies, misinformation was just more speech, good speech. But it's reached the level of a denial of service attack against our attention. We cannot process the legitimate signals in the middle of all of that. And so we need, uh, so, and denial of service attacks are, are um, known to be very difficult to defend against because all of the, the things are technically okay to say individually. It's the sum of them that are difficult to deal with. And um, I've been thinking a lot in this space about the, the balance between free speech and the right to free speech and the right to other kinds of things. Like I may have the right to free speech with my one mouth and body, like take that mouth and body and say what I want, where I want. But then you have the right to take your body and ears somewhere else. You know, if you, if, if you, if you have a huge megaphone and you track someone wherever they go and constantly say it into their ears, that's into their kitchen when they weren't even, you know, just, they were just talking about flip flops. You know, what does, what does that, that, that's a different kind of level of attack. Um, and also, you know, just having the right to speech is not the right to amplification of that speech. Do I have the right to my opinion plus a bot account on the other side that I have parrot the other opinion but make it look ridiculous and extreme so it pushes people towards the, you know, my more reasonable direction? Um, I think we have a lot that we need to grapple with in terms of it's not just about free speech. It's about the pollution of our attention landscape, denial of service attacks on our attention landscape, and um, and you know what we're going to do about amplification in, in platforms. Yeah, this is yeah, this is a very important concern on how we are we are attacked by fake news, for example. And I always thought that 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 um, systems devices also can help us on that. For example. You could have a limited number of not notifications per minute or per day, uh, and then you need to carefully think which, which are the ones that you want. Because people don't do that, and they just put all notifications possible, and, and then you basically you lack 
the right attention. So, uh, so Nisha, I was thinking about about your example, and, may, and maybe the connection is that I think I believe free flops were invented in Brazil, but who knows? I have to check. Um, so the same question. I mean, uh, maybe in your in your uh, uh, startup. So what is your concern, or, or 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 are you working on these concerns, uh, and and how you will mitigate them? So um, primarily kind of the focus that uh, you know, we are doing in my startup is on education and awareness. And so, um, for example, um, later today, I'm speaking um, at EdTech Week about bias in you know, EdTech products and how you know, people who are building EdTech products or people who are um, purchasing EdTech products can ask intelligent questions to understand whether or not these kinds of issues are going to happen because if they happen for example in in education products they can really harm children so everything from you know uh you know selecting a child deciding on a child's educational ability deciding on what kind is the right education path for them these are places where if bias is introduced into the ai the impact on young people is just severe and so, so the focus that I've primarily had is on education kind of across the board, which is why I focus on things like if you're an average person and you need to educate your child on whether or not they, what they should speak to, to an Alexa, you know, that's an education item. If you are a person who is buying an AI product and you are not a technical person, what are the questions you should have? You know, ask, you know, you may be a school superintendent, you may be a doctor, you may be a lawyer, you know, what questions should you ask to kind of make sure that you understand how to use this device in a way that is some that is not snake oil. And it is also not complete fear as well, because complete fear means just don't buy the device. You know, it's problem solved. You know, but but the snake oil thing is really dangerous because you know, if you don't understand that these devices are have a kind of an operating characteristic about them. And if they go out of their characteristic, they can do some really damaging things. If the user doesn't appreciate that in their own sort of language, then I think you have a serious problem. So that's really where I focus on. And so um, that's partly why, you know, kind of the AI literacy initiative is so important to me. And so what I've been really focusing on is how you develop AI literacy in a way that is not data science. So you know, data scientists learn algorithms, they learn, you know, Python, they learn this and they learn statistics and whatnot. But what about the average person? You know, how AI literate should they be and in what context? So to, so to a parent, for example, AI literacy should involve how to take care of their children in the presence of all these devices. And no matter how many of them you get outside, out of your house, there will be some AI device that will reach a child. It's pretty much just a given these days. You know, they cannot be on the internet for even a short period of time without interacting with some kind of an AI. So to me, that kind of AI literacy for parents means helping them navigate that situation. For doctors, it means something else that's much more you know, in terms of law, laws and things like that. So that's sort of my, where my area focus is. Yeah, thank you, Nisha. And, and, and combining what Gina said, what, what you are telling us, I, uh, for example, this, this um, denial of service attack in, in teens is even larger than, than for, for non-native, uh, these are native people. Or, or uh, immigrants that came later to internet uh, because they are all the day in their cell phone, especially if you are a teenager. And basically, I think some, sometimes people is forgetting about uh, concentrating for one hour in one single task, and, and then they fail in other things in their life, which is very important uh, later, in, let's say, university. So, uh, so Gregor, this, the same question. Um, concerns from the Council of Europe or, 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 or from you and, and how you will mitigate them? Yes, uh, I love the examples that were set uh, before both by uh, Jen and uh, Nisha. I especially like the example from Nisha because uh, I think I will be using it with her permission when we will be explaining some of the rights that are being breached uh, by the uh, various applications because what we did and um, if you allow me i uh, posted a link in the chat box uh, to um, a translation of the feasibility study that we developed last year which was uh, converted into a general public uh, type document by the alan turing institute uh, one of their uh, members is also one of our board members, um, David Leslie. 
and he managed to translate what we wrote in legalese into something that's more useful for the general public and explains how different types of human rights uh, are um, endangered or put at risk by the by AI and what should be the key obligations of stakeholders when they are deploying uh, or when they are responsible for such uh, applications. And in the case of Nisha, I would be most worried if such a device spoke to me in the middle of the night, because this would be this would be a big risk to my um, physical and mental integrity, not to mention uh, various um, rights to prevention of harm and human dignity connected. But joke aside, um, we have identified uh, that being aware that we are uh, using or being used by an AI system is one of the key obligations. Humans need to know who they are interacting with. In a way, civilization and our own cognition is dependent on uh, the community aspect. And we are as accustomed of communicating with one one another. So what we are trying to do with um, identify, identification of the currently known risks and opportunities of AI, we are trying to map them to the existing rights and obligations of um, states which are already identified in key uh, international treaties, such as the European Convention on Human Rights. See if there are any gaps in the legal protection and how these legal gaps can be addressed. And we have identified some legal uh, gaps. Um, it's true that we are, do not exist in a legal vacuum. We can address some most of the issues that uh, are being uh, brought now by AI and its dissemination already with the existing instruments. But this approach would be very cumbersome because it requires individual approach. But we are, as uh, we can deduce also from what uh, Professor Matthew said, we are attacked or uh, addressed uh, as a whole population. So we need some sort of a class action suit, and this is not available everywhere. It will be also a question, who do we address it to? We need to uh, have the right of, uh, we need transparency and explainability. Not necessarily that we know how a decision tree has reached its decision, but we need to know what kind of a method is being used with uh, a certain type of application, uh, or at least uh, the procurers of such a system should know what are the limitations of such a system? So we are looking now at uh, a development of a binding horizontal legal instrument and binding or non-binding vertical instruments, meaning horizontal would look at all different types of AI, much similarly to what the European Commission's AI regulation proposal is uh, proposing that we look at all the uh, different types of AI use in a similar way. What would be the rights, uh, what would be the obligations of different stakeholders in different phases, what they should do to make the product safe. And we are also looking what would be the compliance mechanisms, follow-up mechanisms, what I'm missing with the AI proposal, uh, European Commission proposal, are some so, uh, some options for redress or um, evaluation, which would be brought up by the citizens, by the consumers. What I don't like with the uh, that proposal is also that there is some sort of um, um, allowance given to law enforcement uh, or to, for use in public security um, setting because we've seen, especially in the last year, how this can be abused for breaching the, the rights to democ democracy and rule of law. I mean, we can use uh, public security as an excuse to limit the freedom of expression, limit, limit the gathering of uh, individuals. We've seen countries where uh, facial recognition systems are being used without a legal basis 
in order so that police can identify uh, people who are attending protests. And it's happening very close by to where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> and yes. uh, what, we, what we need to have is a horizontal view of what would be the obligation, rights and obligations of different stakeholders. And we also need to look at it from a sectoral perspective. I'm also a member of CEPESH, the European Commission for uh, Efficiency of Judiciary. We're looking there at uh, what would be the standards for different types of applications in the judicial field. Similar things are happening in the social welfare field and child welfare field and so on and so forth. I've mentioned some other organizations before. What we need to do is first identify and mitigate the existing risks and second decide what kind of a society we want and direct the development of technology in that direction. Because development of technology is not something new. Disruption that is brought by technology is not something new. But we cannot solve it by self-regulation alone. We cannot solve it by ethical principles alone. If we take a look just 100 years ago from now, uh, 100 years ago from now, we didn't have any uh, rules about the use of cars on the roads. We didn't have any rules that would say in what with what parameters a car should be developed or how it should drive on the road. There were no rules about the safety belt. Of course, we can say ethically it's necessary that the developer of a car prevents harm to its user or pedestrians. But that is not enough. We need clear rules that the car should drive on the road, that it not, should not drive, drive on the sidewalk, that it should include a safety belt, a seat belt, and so on and so forth. And we need to start developing this slowly. And of course, first of all, AI literacy, understanding of what is going on is important so that we don't solve uh, the problems of general purpose AI, because this is not the problem that we're having right now. Right now, we have a problem of systems that are being used often beyond their capabilities. So that's as simple as I can put my agenda. Uh, thank you, Gregor. Clearly, you have a large agenda. Uh, but, but for example, I, I like that, that, that you remind us of the concerns of, of using this uh, technology by states like, uh, uh, like police. Uh, but uh, we also have to point out that the new regulation excludes uh, from the regulation all military applications, which if we are talking again about the, if you have good or bad intentions, that's clearly for many people a bad intention. But military applications are completely outside the regulation, and, and that's partly because uh, these horizontal regulations cannot uh, cannot enter on 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 the local law of every country in the EU. So, so in my next question, I, I want to continue on on the regulation that just was published yesterday because it's uh, it's the first one that is uh, will have a, a, a huge impact. Like GDPR had a huge impact on the world. Uh, for example, it may be copied in many countries like Brazil, new data protection law is mainly based on GDPR and so on, and many aspects are being cop copied. But one issue that I find from, from, from these regulations, and this will be a double question, so any, of, any one of the speakers can, can jump and, and answer both or each of the questions, but I think there are two things that worry me about this. One is this, that these, these laws are horizontal. So basically, they apply to any type of company any size of company, any field of uh, action. And for example, like in GDPR, we see the problem of uh, self-health data that is very different from, say, uh, customer data or for advertising data, but the same rules apply. And for example, uh, you see that um, if you have a newspaper stand that was delivering newspapers to, to a small town in, say, Italy, they have to comply with GDPR the same way that the multinational in, in say in Dublin in Ireland, and we will not go to the topic of, for example, if the regulator there is doing their job about data protection for European customers. So this is one question. So like, like trying to fit one shoe to all problems, I think that that has some disadvantage sometimes, and, and I would like to, to know your opinion on that. And then I would like to read um, the the first uh, paragraph of the. Uh, forbidden AI practice in the proposal. 
So it says uh, use of an AI system that deploys subliminal techniques beyond a person consciousness in order to materially distort the person's behavior in a manner that causes or is likely to cause that person or another person physical or psychological harm. Here there are like at least three words that are open to interpretation. And then I would like to, to know what do you think uh, about this? Is, is easy to, uh, to, to basically to enforce or not? Uh, for example, uh, fast food will, will fit uh, something that is um, physical harm. Uh, psychological harm, much more complicated. So uh, who wants to start? Anyone wants to start? If I may, just oh. briefly. Yes, go ahead. Uh, two parts. Uh, one, you mentioned military application. I think most of the organizations have a, uh, an issue with that, but uh, only United Nations has the mandate to deal with that. So this is why you have this exclusion in all the documents, both by the Council of Europe and by the European Commission. Secondly, yes, I think that some of the um, elements of the proposal of the European Commission are uh, very detailed. Some need more explanation. And we are now at the first stage where we have a draft. We don't know how this draft was precisely developed and with what motivation. And we will still have a trial lock now, which means uh, we will have proposals by the Council of the European Union, so the European Council, which is led by um, uh, European countries. A different one has a presidency every six months. So they rotate. And another partner in this dialogue or trialogue will be European Parliament. So it can be a process that will take quite a while before we have a final uh, document. And in this process, we will see, we will need to see the explanations to the questions that you have posed and which, we, which cause a problem of interpretation. And I suppose this will allow us to make the process more transparent. On the other hand, how we approach the process at the CAHAI, at the Ad Hoc Committee at the Council of Europe, we are transparent from the beginning and we're trying to, on our website, you can find all the materials from all the working groups and all the plenaries. And this is slowly, slowly developing and getting distilled in the final deliverables. So. Yes. Thank you, Gregor. So, so you, you you mentioned a good point that is that this is the proposal may change. In fact, uh, the, the there was a leak uh, like uh, ten days ago where where a previous version of this proposal was uh, was known. And, and for example, this article and in they say they say venture from January, instead of saying physical or psychological harm, uh, said uh, in their detriment. And then that was much more uh, open to interpretation because uh, I think detriment only can be defined by the person suffering something. It cannot be defined by someone else. It's like it's like many of the biases we we suffer. Um, you need to ask the person if, if, the, if the person feels discriminated or not. It's not the external server who decides that. So Nisha, Gina, do you want to address any of the two questions I did, and then we will go to to to, to the question from the public. Uh, sure. So just a kind of a quick thought. Um, I, I have not studied the new regulation, so I don't want to comment on it. But just as in general, uh, specifically to the, you know, the part of it that you wrote. Now, one thing uh, that, you know, I have seen uh, sort of in my entrepreneurial career. So prior to my current um, company, I founded a company called Parallel M, where we focused on the challenges of production machine learning in large companies, you know, and enterprise companies, and 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 we created this practice called ML Ops. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because you know when regulations like this come out, you know, one of the things that I think personally believe will be just in everyone's interest is to, you know, help translate the regulations into practices that can be implemented and audited 
by corporations and you know and some of the mlops practices how do you create these practices how do you create the tooling you know so that if i'm an average company and i'm you know i'm I, i'm deploying ai i am you know multinational i would like to follow the regulation but i don't know how there's something i can do to kind of you know bring myself closer to meeting it recognizing that the regulation may also change and interpretation might come with time so i think closing that gap is really important and the mlop space is fortunately now extremely um uh, vibrant. There are many tools out there. There's many, you know, practices. The notion of AI governance is now something a lot more people understand, and so forth. And that's absolutely critical to being able to meet regulations like this. And so, one area that possibly would be helpful to sort of maybe draw a parallel is that at least in the United States, and I believe this is true in other countries as well. I just don't have the direct experience. But in the United States, the you know, the financial services organizations in terms of algorithmic governance, there's a fairly sophisticated and well-documented process there, you know, that was set up by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And one thing is that if you go in to look at AI as done by the big banks, for example, there's, you know, massive documentation requirements, you know, there are reviews, there are boards for performing these reviews. And they've developed this process over time, and now they're starting to create these kinds of processes for AI security as well, because people are realizing now that AI can be hacked. And so I think finding that middle ground and helping sort of the ML ops evolve and to help, you know, to help companies meet these needs, I think would be another important part. And that can kind of happen in parallel with the um, refinement of the language as well. So that's the main thing I wanted to add. No, and no, thank you. I mean, a great thought. Uh, Gina. And I'd love to say that, yes, I think it is vague a bit to say forbid subliminal techniques and, you know, physical or psychological harm and one size fits all every size of company. But one, I think we're going to need to iterate on improving legislation and tailoring it more and more till we understand it better. I am thrilled to see them begin to use words like that and start to enter in that space, because I think we've gone way over to the other side where um, these techniques can be used very actively against individuals, against societies with no recognition of are they even able to make a good decision. It's like, would I personally be able to assess the safety of every bridge I drive over? What would the world be like if I had to stop and personally assess that bridge before I could drive over it? Or if I had to personally assess the entire quality of the food delivery chain that led me to anything I purchased or anything that I got, you know, any restaurant I ate at, it would be, you know, basically that's what they're asking us to do. They are putting poison in our food and water, in our internet food and water and saying, you know, and, and also it, it's not just poison, it is addiction. They're putting drugs yeah. Yeah, in our food and water. And we can't say no to them. We can't be citizens of the modern world anymore without them. Like, could you really say no to Zoom? No. Could you really say no to having a cell phone? Not really. I mean, if you actually want to have any impact on the world today, you have to drink the Kool-Aid. And that Kool-Aid is not good for you. The Kool-Aid is not a safe bridge to drive over. It's not safe food to eat. And we need to change that. And back to the example I gave about, like, if you hired someone to clean your house and they did this thing to you that platforms do to you all the time. I, it's interesting, I was talking about this with students in one of my classes and they're saying, well, it's a little different. Like, you know, if they were offering to do it for free, you know, maybe then you wouldn't really have a right to complain. And I'm like, even if they were offering to do it for free, maybe even more so. Like if I said to you, like, you're in a bad position, I'd like to help you out. I'd like to do this for you for free. And then what I really was trying to do was like stick knives in you and like package you up and sell you. Uh, to other people, how much worse would that be? And and honestly, it's not hyperbole. I mean, maybe it is a little, but really it's not very much hyperbole. This is kind of what the world is at the moment. And I don't know how we accept it and keep putting a smile on our face and say, this is okay. So, Dina, thank you for reminding us that we are the product. So, so this is very important. Although the first person that said that was about TV, I think uh, today is, is, is even worse. And and also that they do touch the, the the addiction issue because it's really an addiction, and I see that in teenagers. Um, uh, if I if we and I will s s change the order of the questions in in the chat, because if you think in addictions uh, like for example the tobacco industry had uh, 
I don't know how many years we had to wait to see some regulation there. And so I hope we don't see the same time uh, lapse for internet, uh, because uh, as uh, Marco says, these things are much going much faster than before. So, so time is uh, in some sense shrinking because things are changing. For example, deep learning in only 10 years have changed a lot of things in the use of, of, of AI technology. So I will start with this question. So how to think, and, and this will be my, maybe a short answer from Gregor, how to synchronize the speed of technological development that is very fast and legal regulation, which is usually much slower and sometimes really slow, because these discrepancies is causing lots of problems. So maybe you don't have the answer, Gregor, but any, any clues on, on that question? I'm afraid I'm not 100% sure of the success of uh, any approach because indeed the, there is uh, there is no synchronicity and uh, there are also attempts of slowing down the process. If we take the wrong road in regulating uh, AI development and application, we might actually encourage the current practices. If we create a system that is uh, favoring, for example, large developers, we might actually strengthen the, their position and the monopoly they have on uh, citizens and the impact that they have on human rights. So if you create a system that uh, requires too much uh, ex ante um, bureaucracy, before a certain application can be put on the market. What I think is important that we look at uh, the applications, the systems from a risk-based perspective, that we try to require um, impact analysis by um, the ones that we have control over, which is the state players especially. And in the long run that we are also uh, require them to take a harder look at the private actors who are using us as products, basically, what was said. This is how uh, the economy has developed in the past two decades. And um, hopefully um, we don't take the wrong way or that we don't waste too much energy finding the wrong solutions. In a way, what the European Commission is proposing looks like a shock therapy with the high fines for not obliging, but I'm not sure that this is uh, the only way how we can ensure conformity. I think it's more important that we spread the awareness of, well, that we spread the AI literacy or literacy in general and that we um, in, uh, give power to the citizens who can demand their rights, both from the state and from the private sector, in disclosing what is being uh, applied to them, how it is used, and how it affects them. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Gregor. So let me go to, to a question for uh, the set for all, the four of us from the audience. So it says, knowing that the information you are providing will not be misused, but can help others, would you be comfortable with sharing data and information with intelligent devices that would be trustable, taking care about your privacy, but on the other hand, also be open, transparent, and even certified? For example, the, they said predicting traffic congestions may be a simple example, like, like Waze. So, um, Nisha, do you want to, to, to start? Uh, sure. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's a personal judgment and everybody kind of falls on a different area of the spectrum um, where I fall mostly just because of some combination of my understanding of the technology and my nature, I guess, um, is um, generally things like my, you know, where I drive and where I go is not necessarily something that bothers me when people do it, but I draw the line at anything that can be used in some form of fraud, like, um, you know, credit card numbers, you know, purchasing patterns and things like that. And the way I usually tend to enforce this in my life is I, 
you know, I do not give any kind of information over the phone, regardless of who calls. Uh, I pick my battles with respect to who I interact with on the internet and things like that. Um, I don't sign up for, you know, loyalty programs and things of that nature. Those, so those are the kind of my sort of main coping sort of rituals. My rules for my daughter are much more strict. You know, I do not, you know, I'm very concerned if her face or her name ever appears anywhere on the internet, for example, you know, and things like that. And so, so that's sort of where I've sort of chosen to draw the line somewhere. I think it's, you know, the, the devices are in our lives. It's really hard to work these days without mm -hmm. having them in some form. For me, at least, getting them out of my life is not an option. So I've just chosen what I've decided to share and what not share. So thank, thank you, Nisha. Um, you put a very important point is that it's, it's a personal decision. I would say also it's a very, also very, it's a, it's a geographical decision because in the example of, uh, say, traffic, um, if someone learns when you are not at home, in, in some countries it's more dangerous than in other countries. So, 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 so maybe in the US you will not be concerned, although in some regions you may be concerned, but in other countries that could be a concern. So uh, Gina. So I would love, empower, technology is powerful for good and evil. If it's powerful, it can be powerful for both. And I would love to get the honest benefits of technology to optimizing my life and the things I care about. I really, really want that. But I do not, I think right now we're accepting drugged and poisoned food. And we have to say no to that if we're ever going to get healthy food served to us. And so um, even though I would really like many of those benefits, um, I have already feel like I've said yes to way more things than I would like. There are lots of technologies I would like to say no to. I've tried to get rid of Facebook quite a few times, and then I get pulled back in for something or the other. Um, I have I have drawn the line at no DNA technology, I know 23andMe, no Ancestry.com. Um, I've drawn the line at audio commanded devices in my house. I try to choose non-smart devices when I can. I just want... I don't want a surveillance device. I want a device that will do its job and mind its own business. Um, I, I try to strengthen my local networks or my direct networks. I try to know how to contact the people I care about, uh, not through WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, email. So I'd like to know how I could uh, um, send them a letter. And I noticed the postal service, at least in the US, is a little under attack, which I find interesting. H how to find someone in person if I want to talk to them. That's not always super easy, um, but strengthening local connections, I think, um, is important. Um, you know, and to the point about do we have, you know, like legislation moves slowly. I appreciated Gregor's point about we, we, we can't, we don't want to get it wrong. So we want to take our time and do it right. But I'm also, you know, I think a lot about, you know, people driving the Titanic thought they might have time to turn the ship around. I don't know if we have time to turn the ship around anymore. And I look back in history and I think the times where at least the narrative I was taught of history, you know, history uh, hides a lot of other ugliness, but, you know, maybe, you know, the world was almost lost to tyranny. I think what would it have, would, would that almost have gone the way it did? Would it have gone in a good direction if, they, you know, uh, the powers that be had a full map to everyone's uh, friend list, an audio device uh, monitoring them, they knew where that you were at, every, at all times? I'm not so sure. Um, so... I would. I am trying to vote with uh, saying no, as much as possible. This is one thing. We're we're animals in the zoo, but one thing they still need from us is our role as consumers. They want us to buy things, so I'm trying to buy as little as possible and only buy things that I actually believe are 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 business models I want to support, which is few and far between. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gina. So so we still have animals in zoos. So, so that hasn't changed yet in, in, in most countries. Um, and, and you said something important. You, you said, I have said yes many times to too much, but in many, in many cases, we're not saying really an explicit yes. We're not saying, yeah, I, I know all the consequences. I know all the harms. Uh, we are just saying yes in many, many ways, in explicit ways, uh, and, and sorry, in implicit ways, and without reading the terms of usage, and so on of apps or, for example, with busy websites without knowing what, 
what they are doing with our cookies and so on. And, and for example, um, there are some steps from the industry to change this. Uh, I would say regarding the question, because there was the, to the four of us, some, uh, some field where I think that that's a very important question is health. So how we can share health data, because that's for the well-being of, of all people, uh, especially, for example, in this uh, pandemic uh, time. Uh, but, um, sorry, I, lo I, I lost the thought I had that was important. So, so that, that, com that, that some comments about this from the audience that you can check in the, in the sideline. And there's another question that says, how much do you believe certification of AI systems will resolve on, of these situations? So, any can I say what? Can I say one thing quick about health data? Yes. Is there time? One quick thing about health data. So I love the narrative um, that you know we're gonna all donate our our data and we're gonna get health advances that benefit us all. I love that narrative. I would very much like it to be true. But you know, in the U.S., people who need insulin can't even get it, and you know, insulin is not exactly a high tech technology. And I believe something like the patent for insulin or whatever was just given. So I think that's really important to understand. In many ways, benefits are being taken from people. They're being sold the narrative that they will benefit when it's not at all clear that they will. That's a great point. So yeah, the, the, the perception is different from reality in, in many cases, yes. Especially in the US. Uh, he, here, living in the US in the last uh, five, six years, I've learned that perception is almost everything. And I will not talk about politics. Um, so the question of certification of AI systems or audits or, or say um, registering algorithms, so more transparency, is that a solution? May I? Yes, Gregor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to join uh, both questions before and now. I, I know, I've mentioned Snake Oil before, and Jana and uh, Nisha have also mentioned it before. I would like to point that 50 years ago in Europe, uh, there was basically no control over medical products that were put on the market. Uh, and um, we didn't know what were the ingredients in the medicines that were being sold, what, would, what were the side effects, what were the indications, what were the counterindications, and so on and so forth. And what it took, uh, not only in Europe, but also globally, was to form a system called Pharmacopeia, which is a system of control of medical products and uh, procedures. And in case of Europe, it was actually also the Council of Europe that created the convention on the elaboration of the European Pharmacopeia in 1964. So it's 57 years ago. And uh, from then on, any type of medical product that is to be sold in the market needs to undergo certification. It needs to be tested for its uh, effects, side effects, in, uh, what are the ingredients and so on and so forth. And I would say that certification is a useful system for a number of applications uh, in selected fields of application. For example, for the use in high-risk areas, such as law enforcement, uh, justice, even uh, social welfare, I don't think it's something that we can, we need to require in various industrial applications. It's where, uh, that's where the customers or the market can solve it all. It's the same thing as, uh, we don't use, we shouldn't use AI as a generic term in terms of what, how many risk are, risks are associated with it. If we have supervised learning, it's different if you have unsupervised learning or um, reinforced and reinforcement learning. Um, you have a different uh, data set, you have different output and so on. And with uh, certification, you can address uh, adequacy of a type of procedure or a final product but we need to know that the product can change and the procedure can also be manipulated you can have auditing which 
requires an external, uh, which allows an external uh, stakeholder or a participant to verify the uh, adequacy of the procedure or the product. Ad auditing, I would be all for it, but I wonder if most players would be allowed, would allow uh, opening the code or the data sets that were used for development of their applications. So I think we will need a combination of different uh, compliance mechanisms. And uh, this is why I think it's necessary that we get it right. Of course, we need to get it right quickly, which is where I find the proposal of uh, the uh, European Commission for the moment a bit problematic because it's giving uh, free pass to law enforcement. And at the same time, it's uh, putting too high of a um, barrier for uh, products which are put on the market because through that it could be providing more opportunities to already established players and not allowing the small players to uh, participate on the equal basis because of course this involves costs. So it depends for what, but I'm all for certification for certain areas, yes. A very good point about about the fair market and, and, and how easy it is to enter the market and and be fair with all players. So, Nisha, Gina, do you want to address the question? Um, sure. I think you know I definitely agree with a lot of the things that uh, Gregor said. Um, I think the impacts are different and usages are different and. You know, to, to go back to Gina's example about a bridge, you know, the usage equivalent of a bridge, I should not have to understand how the bridge works in order to decide whether or not to cross it. I should feel like the mere fact that it exists means someone has decided it's safe and there was a process in place. And this is a, a level of engineering rigor that is not yet applied to AI and absolutely needs to be for certain areas, you know where human lives and livelihood are at risk. So all the different areas that Gregor mentioned. Uh, certification for AI, I, I suspect, is going to be a serious challenge in its own self because of the complexities of the algorithms, deciding upon the metrics and so forth. And so the more progress that is made, the sooner the better in terms of you know reducing this gap between the technology racing ahead and, you know, the laws and the regulations sort of catching up. So real investment in understanding how to meaningfully certify certain areas of usages, I think makes a lot of sense. For the you know for the um, other things like recommendation systems, is it recommending a book to me and things like that, I think it'll be extremely challenging to put certifications in place for those. And I tend to agree that already AI has a data problem, as in the more data you have, the more valuable you know, you're, your, your, you are as a company because your ability to kind of monetize that data. And so like, you know, when startups are being created right now in the AI space, um, you know, we, we call this the cold start problem, which is mm -hmm. you want to solve a problem, you don't have a data. Nobody's going to give you data until you can prove that you can solve the problem. So a lot of things just die right there in terms of, you know, where are you mm -hmm. going? Are you going to be able to do, do you have the data to solve the problem? So anything that you do to make that harder is going to favor the larger companies at the expense of the smaller ones because they have sort of the, the machine in motion to create that, you know, to make that link work. So that's something definitely to be, you know be aware of is that you, you don't really want to stifle necessarily the innovation of it. Uh, but at the same time, I think certification is a must, at least for certain industries. Yeah, I'm completely right, uh, Nisha, uh, about the data. I will comment on that, but I would prefer to hear first uh, Gina's answer. Uh, thank you. I, I would say, yes, certifications are a good thing in, re in regulated areas like hiring and housing and credit and things, yes, even more. But I think really we are failing to to grapple with how just that the technological solution might not be the right one for many things, that we may have be building fundamentally shaky bridges and towers. I mean, really, what are these systems based on? They're based on either data from the past or basically the preference of, of large crowds. And both of those things have a lot of problems with them. You know, you might as well learn from the past because that's all you have to learn from. But the past is a pretty ugly place. It has a lot of bias in it. it. There's a lot of people left out in the past. And when you say, oh, let's just see what 
what what people want to do, like, you know, the the let's just listen to everyone. One, you're not listening to everyone. You're listening to a very small set of people producing digital text, often just in English. Um, and, you know, we used to in regulated areas, the things with certifications, we used to say things like, you know, uh, these are the rules, these are the things you get to consider and the things you don't. And I don't care what the crowd thinks or what the past data says. Like there's court cases, for example, in the US that just because your, your, your customers prefer for the person waiting on them to be white or black or man or woman or whatever, they don't get, that doesn't get to matter. You still have to have unbiased hiring practices. But now we just say, oh, let's just get data from the past or let's get data from what people want. And that is the beacon of the future we should have. We have fundamentally changed the way we make decisions in this society without discussion and we're basing it on pretty shaky foundations. So, yes, we should certify things. We should do better. But really, maybe we we ought to do a lot more fundamentally questioning the way we're driving, you know, the way we're going, period. So thank, thank you, Gina. It's, it's like um, it, it, to remind us that, that you are learning from data or you're learning from people directly. And then I would like to point out that basically you are certifying an AI system. Then you are in some sense certifying that data and also those users. So, and that's a big, big difference from, say, a medicine. Uh, so you are certifying almost the whole world. And also certification has another problem because you are learning all the time. Certification is just the point in time where you can say, yeah, I certify this. But what about one month later, two months later, one year later? Can we apply the same certification to the system that has changed, for example, 10 times because of more data or changes on the, on the optimization function of the model? So I, I think that the certification has many problems, issues in this. So we don't have much time, so I, I would like to... to Sadly, I, I cannot take the um, uh, Nico's uh, question in, in the chat. So maybe if any of you would like to answer him, uh, it's related to what we have discussed. But to finish, I would like to, to have like your final words, final remarks, something that, that you wanted to say and, and I didn't ask because I was not that smart. Uh, let's say a two minute um, final words from each of you. And, and let's start with Nisha using the, the original order. Uh, sure. Uh, so um, I don't think there was anything that you forgot to ask, but, but I can maybe make a few comments. Um, so I think this is, first of all, it's a very important area. It's, I think, also an extremely early stage you know, area in terms of the technology is racing forward really fast. And one thing about AI that is I found, you know, what's sort of very, you know, kind of I guess it's either impressive or concerning, depending on how you look at it, is one thing that I've learned is that the time from the creation of a new AI research innovation in a lab to its use in, an, in a corporate domain is now less than a year. So think about how fast it moves. And why does it move that fast? It's because of a combination of the way that this stuff is disseminated, there's a lot of open source out there. Things open, hit open source very quickly. They get glued together with other things. You can create apps really fast. And so new AI to someone having that AI in front of them, really short amount of time. That also means that you really have to be extremely focused on thinking about these certifications and these issues and you know things like AI literacy is because the AI is moving super fast. So you, so you want to at least keep up, you know, ideally get ahead of it, but at least keep up. So that's the main thing I would say is that, you know, the technology is moving at breakneck speeds. There's some forces, natural technical forces enabling that to happen. And so the other things like, you know, keeping track of it, educating people about it, creating literacy initiatives have to try to move as fast. So that's my main point. Thank you, Nisha. Gregor? Yes, thank you. Um, before I finish uh, with uh, and say bye, I would like to go one step back. We need to avoid techno solutionism, and we need to be aware of what the limitations of the system and of the humanity are. And uh, we shouldn't be paying uh, too much attention. Well, we should be paying attention to the long-term risks, but we should be dealing with the short-term risks. And one of the risks right now can be connected to the hopes that we have uh, for applications 
in connection with the, with the pandemic, for example. And there are risks, social risks that we can have with the systems for uh, uh, passports uh, or uh, social credit uh, systems that are based on AI, or at least they allege to be based on AI in connection with the pandemic risks. And we've had in the past year countries which have um, put into legislation and as an obligation for citizens to have uh, smartphone uh, applications, which are basically acting as smart passports, but they're not uh, based on facts. They're not based on evidence. They're based on prediction and they're limiting human rights. We will have attempts such as this also in the near future, and we are, we're having them now, and we should make it very clear as an academic and professional uh, uh, group of people that this is unacceptable, that we need evidence-based and quality-based applications and solutions. That if I refer back to snake oil, that we must know what solutions are based on, that are based on sound science, on solid science, not on pseudoscience or some, uh, some solutions that are basically not effective. Because it's very, uh, the deterioration of the human society can happen very quickly if we succumb to uh, things like, I mentioned techno-solutionism or reliance on uh, technology or myths that are not proven in facts. And at the same time, as we are fearing AI, we should not put too much hope in unproven solutions. So again, literacy before regulation, but regulation is necessary for some fields. So I thank you for my attention. Thank, thank you, Gregor. Uh, Dina. Oh. Well, Gregor, I like your focus on not, focus, you know, not techno-focused solutions or thinking that that is where the answer is. Um, and Nisha, I like your focus on education. I wish, you know, I'm a pretty optimistic person. You know, I've danced a lot of dances. I've, you know, like lot, taken lot walks in the rain. I'm, I'm a pretty happy, go lucky person. But I really feel like we're headed for the cliff on a speeding train. And I say that in the most optimistic way I possibly can. And I ask myself, what is my responsibility as a rider on this train that actually understands a little bit how the train works, maybe more than many people? So I'm going to be nice to my fellow passengers on the train, but I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to tell them that smart technology is in surveillance or that big platforms are really out to help you or, you know, that... Um, trusted computing means you can trust it. I'm not going to lie to them. And I'm not going to say, I think it's going to be all right. I don't know if I'm going to spend all day long, every day screaming like a mad woman that we're headed for the cliff. Cause that gets old, you know, and I'd like to dance on the train and I don't know if the rain analogy would extend to the train, but like, I'd like to spend some time, you know, like just chatting with my fellow passengers, even where, if we're about to go over the cliff, I would really like us all to be able to stop the train. And that's the crazy thing is we can. We all collectively have the ability to stop the train and say, we want new rules. Like this set of rules that we're being offered, we want technology, but we want technology that serves us, that contributes to healthy human beings, healthy societies, democratic principles. We want that. But we're going to have to say no to the drugged food we're being served. And it's not easy because it's very addictive and it's hard to be a citizen of the modern world without it. So, you know, for those of you who are, who are technologists, if you can find a way to vote with your feet, don't go work for places that are building crap and serving up drugged food to people. Try to find a place to make your living, even if it's a smaller living, building something that you can actually look back at and say, I didn't destroy the world for the sake of my paycheck. Um, let's not let's not lie to each other about where the train is headed, and let's see if we can stop the train. That's as optimistic as I can manage. <laughs> well, well, thank you, thank you, Dina. Uh, we we have seen. I mean, I, I see uh, I see glimpses of of improvement, like uh, like uh, getting rid of cookies or or things like uh, the new 
iOS uh, system that, that will ask you explicitly if you want to be tracked or not. But it's true that, that we are going in, in like, a, I like your, your analogy, in a, in a fast train, and we are all on drugs, so we are all happy, and that's a problem, and only some of us are also happy on drugs, but we know that we are on drugs, and we say, well, this is going to the cliff, we need to do something. And the problem is that we need to, to like, like uh, all of us decide at once. It's not like one of us will make a difference, like all of us should do. And, 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 and as, as Gregor and, and all, uh, Ju and, and Nietzsche said, um, we can do from our collective some, some, something. Like, for example, I would like to see more AI used to, to stop AI. This is one, one way to, to say, yeah, it's techno solutionism, but I think it's something that may help every person to, to for example, avoid manipulation or nudging or other kinds kind of things. Uh, if we don't regulate ourselves too, I, I feel like, like insurance companies will come and, we, and this will become like health in the US, much more expensive, much more complicated, and then only some group of people with you will get more work and it's not us. So thank you all for participating, and I hope you had an interesting discussion. Uh, also, thanks to the audience for all your questions and also the feedback. And uh, have a rest of uh, the conference, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, to everybody, uh, so my role is here as a general chair, um, and um, so let's make now like five minute break uh, uh, with a short video, uh, well, like promotion video about Slovenia, and then we will uh, return to the, uh, the keynote uh, on uh, quantum computing. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. The biggest part of me you will never see, you will only feel it. Hi to the 40th app conference from Alenka Slavinets, the author of Slovenia and Asli Pitana Horses by Alenka Slavinets. Uh, welcome to see the exhibition and my film, how this was created about the horses and about soul of Lipitaner, how how was embodied by Spanish and Arab horses in here, in the cradle of Lipitaner. This is in Lipica, in Slovenia, where love is in all of us. Welcome. Thank you. Dear friends, let me remind you how I have been brought to existence and how I have appeared in mind and heart of the Archduke Charles in times of Habsburg Empire in 5080, when Archduke decided to buy and restore my cradle, Stad Farm Lipica, in today's Slovenia. I have been so privileged to be embodied in such a magnificent land in climate of the karst, embraced by the hills with flourishing postures, glamorous trees, refreshing summer shades, sun and winds, vastness of landscape and endless wide wooden fences that make the walls of my home, but not the boundaries of the freedom. Thanks to devoted loving people, owners who cherished our endurance, our suitableness for dressage and carriage driving, we never gave up on breathing ever since. 
Thank you for welcoming me on May 1958 in Lipica Stad Farm, where the best features of ancient ancestors have been merged into my elegant figure. I'm black when I'm born, and I enjoy playful shades of gray until I'm four, when I reach majestic white to present excellency of Lipitan breed. Today we represent a living culture heritage of humanity. Together we make up to 370 members in Lipica Cradle and over 10,000 members all around the world. When I look in your eyes and you look back in mine, we feel divinity, timelessness, peace, oneness of life in past, present and future, where we all exist in presence of love, and there is no other option for you but to surrender your heart to my healing medicine. Who am I becoming in your presence, dear friend? As I become whiter and mature through the years, my competitiveness also fades and turns into affectionate and trusted relationship with you, fellow human. With you to always remember who you are. Three is the one who feels home in his heart and soul and is not limited by any fences or political borders, which I have experienced from Habsburg monarchy to Italy, Yugoslavia, and today is Slovenia in European Union. You inspire me with your uniqueness, calmness, peacefulness, harmony. You inspire me with your glam, pride, wildness, courage, presence, free spirit, resilience, endurance, power, curiosity, Beauty, playfulness, posing, oh, self-confidence, and belonging to her, loyalty, partnership, joyfulness, dancing, movement. In your presence, doubt, fear, competition, judgments, lack, shame, guilt, simply can and don't. Therefore, you have divine healing powers for a human heart. You are here to open our hearts and to resurrect peace and oneness of all nature with humankind and all living beings who shall live in harmony by laws of nature. Lipitsan, you are here to tune me in with my soul, mind, body and heart. You're here to tune me in, in my trust, integrity, dignity, respect, humbleness, gratitude, compassion, serenity, and sovereignty. With my white, shiny, silky hair, I'm graceful, I'm divine. I'm aware of my Michelangelo card breast and strong legs which are followed by the sound of my horseshoes beat of my heart. The children so deny Kopitar. Shoes shall be judged only by shoemaker, don't you think? I, Lipitan, am here to open your hearts now and forever, to feel love in all of us once for all. 
In return, you are engaged to inscribe the unique knowledge and traditional practices related to my well-being into UNESCO representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. I'm trustful, I'm kind, I'm loving, daring, I'm determined, I'm royal, I'm friendly, I'm self-reliant, I'm resilient, I'm powerful, I'm impressive, I'm wild, I'm enough, I'm your partner, I'm your protector. Are you my dear friend? Freedom of choice leads us all to foundation of truth, integrity, dignity, respect, love, and peace. Thank you, Lipitsans, for bringing me back home where my soul is born, where my heart is open, and where I dare to dream of future world peace 2030. All is possible when I surrender and believe. For this I have to know myself, don't you think? You leave me breathless seeing your impressive arrival, elegant moves, seducive dance, your silky white beautiful hair, your self-confidence, humbleness and gratitude. The biggest part of me you will never see, you will only feel it. Sincerely yours with love, Lipitan Ambassador, Alenka Slavinets.
Ganesh? Yeah, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, um, could you... Uh, uh, so we have a slight problem with uh, Krista uh, being... Not great. a problem. Happy to, uh, happy to fill in. Okay, great. So then, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, we had this slight logistic uh, 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 problem. And instead of uh, Krista Swore, which was supposed to be uh, giving keynote now, um, Instead, uh, Ganesh will uh, do his keynote now, and we will have Krista uh, afterwards. So, uh, so Ganesh's uh, um, keynote was uh, really arranged uh, fairly late. So I spotted an article which he wrote uh, and published actually uh, just recently uh, in AI Experts, if I remember right. On yeah, I yeah, on the future of uh, or AI challenges, right? And a similar uh, article was written like uh, in 1988, many years ago, right? And back then, predictions, uh, which uh, Ganesh, uh, you did, right? So many of them actually uh, were ful fulfilled in more or less, right? But mostly yes, right? If I understand right. And recently, you, you made uh, this new uh, article, which I think was really done well. Uh, even through consultation with many other people. Um, and uh, so basically I asked Ganesh if he could present the this paper, uh, this future AI challenges uh, uh, to the conference, uh, which uh, fits nicely into this uh, evening where we have uh, a little bit more uh, AI. And uh, yeah, Ganesh, uh, please, maybe uh, if you could uh, start with would be great, yeah. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Let me uh, share my screen here. Are you able to uh, see my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, hold on one second. The rightmost button on the bottom. Yeah, in the application, the um, doesn't give me uh, a chance for the PowerPoint. Maybe I'll try the entire screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great, now we see it. So now you see it? Yeah, great, yes, perfect. Okay, um, so once again, um, uh, thank you, uh, Marco. Um, it's an honor to be here. Let me uh, start off by saying, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and now I should say uh, machines, right? Uh, a lot of the machines are recording, uh, listening. We're gonna be talking about uh, AI grand challenges. I know the uh, web conference uh, has a hoary uh, history, so, uh, uh, and Marco, I believe, has done an excellent job of uh, stringing together a number of um, high-profile uh, keynotes as well as uh, papers. I'm probably uh, 
um, a um, you know a voice. Uh, so I take it uh, for uh, what it is. And uh, Earth Day greetings to everybody. So it's a uh, special uh, day. We'll um, because of that we'll also talk a little bit about uh, AI and uh, how it can help uh, with some of the UN um, uh, SDGs and so on. So I have uh, a dotted line to Carnegie Mellon. I'm on the adjunct faculty. I also do a few different things uh, from an investment perspective as well as an entrepreneurial uh, perspective. So I have a bit of a uh, an eclectic background. Let me uh, slide down here. Um, you can see the next slide, uh, right, uh, Marco? So uh, this is um, the um, article uh, Marco was uh, referring to. Actually, the original article uh, was from the mentor of mine, uh, Professor Raj Reddy, who is a Turing Award winner. And this particular uh, um, article is a refresh. So I um, called on about six thought leaders uh, from uh, academia, as well as the investment slash uh, nonprofit or practitioner world. And we came up. Uh, with uh, some interesting uh, viewpoints on uh, where we are with respect to AI and what some of the challenges are for uh, the um, current decade. The old one had a 30 year time frame. It was 1988 that, uh, uh, and many people have made uh, predictions for uh, AI. That was uh, a little bit timely and special because uh, I think um, the um, AAA organization was gaining speed and also a lot of the um, advancements uh, with respect to hardware and so on in the 80s were uh, sort of um, uh, providing a little bit of a tailwind. And then there was a bit of an AI winter and some people say this is sort of the uh, second or the uh, third uh, resurgence. And in terms of where we are headed, I believe the um, mantra is, uh, uh, where we want to navigate towards is off the people, by the people, with machines, for the people. And uh, when I talk about machines, um, I talk about machines that uh, people, a normal person would sort of consider useful, clever, or intelligent. So that's sort of a, a good way of um, framing where we are headed. So these were Raj Reddy's 1988 uh, challenges. So let's sort of go through them uh, real quickly he had talked about the uh, world champion chess machine and chess was uh, easy and since then there have been a number of uh, other advancements in the uh, gaming field uh, we saw um, poker um, the uh, superhuman poker capability actually was uh, developed uh, in the last few years at Carnegie Mellon uh, a colleague of sorts of mine uh, professor uh, Sandholm who you may uh, recognize and uh, AlphaGo obviously got a lot of uh, press and the uh, you know, reigning champion, right? Lisa Dole said, I'm hanging up my hat. Um, AI is too powerful type of thing. So we've had uh, games uh, that have been conquered uh, in terms of mathematical discovery, which is one of the other challenges um, that was outlined. I'd say minor discoveries have been completed. I think if there's a major discovery um, then people would sort of wake up. It's been used for uh, uh, theorem proving. I think there's a, a gentleman here actually uh, across the street uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, Tom Hales, who used it, uh, who used the computer as an assist to uh, prove the uh, Kepler conjecture. And now um, there are some newer uh, prizes, Olympiads and so on uh, that are uh, um, uh, ongoing that have been announced to sort of spur a little bit more uh, true uh, discovery, if you will, um, in the field. And then the tr translating a telephone was uh, talked about by uh, uh, Raj Reddy. I'd say that's uh, nearly complete. We have uh, a whole host of uh, translation apps uh, from Google, from uh, uh, Facebook, from Microsoft. Maybe the form factor can be improved. You do need a smartphone and a reliable Wi-Fi to uh, get to the uh, uh, facile translation, but if you're a, uh, um, a farmer in um, an emerging uh, economy, you don't have perhaps access to the infrastructure that's sort of required to do the uh, translation for you. That's where, uh, you know, when we were having this discussion uh, in Raj's office, he said, uh, 
maybe uh, not quite type of thing, but I would chalk it up to uh, mostly done. Accident avoiding car, um, I would say the uh, journey is uh, halfway complete. We're not quite uh, there uh, to the level five driving. So SAE, actually I have some uh, friends here at uh, SAE, the organization that sort of defines the um, levels uh, one through five. In fact, at level five, they're talking about sort of not having a steering wheel or not even having a uh, set of pedals and so on. So we're quite far away from that. So we can say the journey is uh, half complete. But there are also uh, some interesting issues. I know any fatality in a self-driving car uh, makes headlines, uh, even though there are a number of accidents um, every day. Uh, so that tends to sort of um, uh, dampen um, uh, the common citizen enthusiasm, if you will. And then uh, there are also uh, policy issues. There have been uh, uh, many uh, papers written. Um, uh, there are a couple of them we uh, reference in the article. Rawan has done uh, a number of uh, sort of these model machine experiments, if you will, if you're in a car, you have a car in front of you, uh, and then you have some occupants in your car. What should the self-driving car do? Should it swerve to the right? Maybe there are a couple of uh, pedestrians, and to make it interesting, there are scenarios, uh, kids versus older people. Um, how should some uh, bad choices be uh, chosen among, right? Uh, and, and so on. So I, I don't think there is any consensus. And I think they have the Model Machine Project has uh, done these surveys uh, uh, for different groups of people, uh, different cohorts, uh, and the conclusions are not um, um, necessarily the same, right? Uh, different cultures, different countries, different cohorts uh, think about uh, things differently and then valuing sort of kids versus uh, adults' lives. That's also the utility function tends to be uh, different uh, in different cultures, different countries, and so on. So that's interesting reading, but I think some of those uh, ethical challenges will also need to be um, um, discussed and then policymakers will have to make some hard decisions and their regulations may not be uh, uniform uh, across um, different countries and so on as well. So you may have some issues if you take uh, uh, a self-driving car uh, across the border, for instance. Uh, it'd be nice to have uh, more um, uniform uh, regulations there. And then in terms of uh, self-organizing systems, I think what Raj had meant there was um, uh, something different. I've, I've taken a broader interpretation to include sort of swarm computation, uh, which is sort of interesting. And there has been some recent uh, uh, progress with the uh, Xenobots uh, out of um, the East Coast here. Uh, so moderate amounts of progress in terms of, um, you know, can a uh, uh, system sort of organize. And some of it could be uh, sort of learning from a textbook, um, things like repairing uh, machines by uh, um, reading a manual. So you have a uh, uh, washing machine that's broken. Can a robot uh, uh, read the manual and sort of repair the washing machine and so on? So I think we're quite far away from uh, those sorts of scenarios. I think um, we do talk about this uh, project Aristo from the uh, Allen Institute, which is now able to uh, score very highly. I believe it's the eighth grade uh, um, science test. Uh, so non-diagrammatic uh, reasoning, which means it can read the uh, textual question and then take uh, an objective uh, uh, choice uh, uh, set of questions and uh, answer them at a um, very uh, skilled uh, level, I believe at a 90 or 95% uh, accuracy uh, level. So that's been uh, significant progress in that sort of um, narrow area, if you will, in terms of self-replicating systems. Um, and this is uh, for something like you get to uh, uh, Mars, can you take uh, uh, a minimum set of building blocks? Can you create uh, machines? Uh, in situ there for uh, further uh, um, activities and so on uh, is interesting. We also needed, I think the last year brought this to focus. Uh, now in Silicon Valley, people sort of talk about, um, um, you know, being uh, the earthquake risk, right? So what happens if the uh, big one, if you will, uh, uh, strikes California? So we don't have a true backup to uh, Silicon Valley, uh, the cloud, 
and some of these other things can help you. But I think sort of getting up and running um, literally within days uh, in a neighboring state for uh, employees or for um, all the uh, corporations to get uh, 70, 80, 90% of their uh, systems and processes um, uh, back um, online and functioning is a major challenge. Likewise, uh, financial exchanges, um, clearing houses, uh, um, uh, hospital infrastructure, how do we sort of replicate it for um, uh, the uh, what they call the uh, just in case uh, scenarios, right? Which sort of gets me uh, to the point uh, about supply chains as well. We sort of over optimize them to uh, just in time. So over the last year, we realized sort of these uh, just in case scenarios are uh, equally important for uh, infrastructure, uh, different kinds of infrastructure uh, from uh, roads, bridges to uh, uh, electronic medical records and so on. So that's something we need to be uh, thinking about uh, modicum of progress is how I chalked it up. And then there were a number of um, uh, knowledge related uh, implicit challenge goals, if you will. Uh, there is an efficient framework for uh, searching via Google and other web platforms. But again, when you do a Google search, um, one of the uh, things I say is it's not obvious uh, the top three hits um, all day, the most uh, current uh, uh, documents um, all day. Uh, um, high in terms of authority. So if you're searching for heart disease, uh, if a paper has come out yesterday and it's from, say, the Cleveland Clinic or one of the uh, top cardiologists in Europe or Asia, uh, that should bubble to the top. But more importantly, it may not be highly uh, linked yet in terms of um, the newer page rank and whatever algorithms. Uh, but I think the authority, the vintage, uh, should uh, be exposed and that should be uh, giving you uh, comfort um, um, you know, gets to the trust issues, which we'll sort of talk about. So one of the problems we're facing is now there's a lot of um, content being generated. So speed of information generation is increasing uh, geometrically. The average quality is uh, decreasing because there's a lot of fake news. There's a lot of questionable uh, news. Uh, I use the cardiac example. I'm not an expert. I'm not a healthcare expert, but I can now write a blog about uh, heart conditions and maybe there is some personal experience some folks who have gone through some of these medical uh, conditions as a patient maybe writing about it um, that has valuable information but it again needs to be taken in context maybe when you uh, aggregate it across a similar cohort and then combine it with some expert opinion it becomes very valuable so how do you curate that information human attention span alone cannot um, um, do this task because uh, as the amount of information uh, grows geometrically, human attention span at best can grow uh, uh, arithmetically, right? We can burn the midnight oil, we can hire a few more people for the project and so on. So that's uh, a significant uh, challenge that still uh, remains. I think Raj sort of calls it uh, partly the uh, unfinished uh, business, both in terms of uh, not only uh, the uh, type of information he also talks about, you know, can you uh, generate uh, or point to five or 10 minute uh, short video clips to educate folks on a new concept or a new field. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, machine repair. Uh, if a new model of a, uh, a washing machine or a dishwasher comes out, uh, you know, can you point to uh, the updates um, in the, uh, um, uh, manual, if you will. So what has changed? So the robot or even the human may be familiar with the previous version of the uh, machine. So just pointing out that these are the incremental changes and this is what you need to do uh, to fix um, things in this model may be uh, very, uh, very interesting. So let me segue to uh, some challenges we have put forth uh, for the uh, 2020s. Um, and again, it's not meant to be comprehensive. It's not meant to be uh, the uh, most uh, significant ones. Think of it as sort of uh, representative. The reason for that is there are now hundreds of potential challenges. But the key thing is, as you make progress towards uh, some of these challenges, the building blocks for uh, generating these solutions can be reused elsewhere. So in some sense, the journey is the destination. And that's what um, 
uh, Francesca Rossi uh, wrote about uh, in the article as well. You can she talks about ethics, but she also makes this key point that uh, um, it's not one goal. Many of the uh, progress uh, uh, items towards the goal are uh, reusable or interrelated, uh, and so on. So um, let's go down the list in terms of health. Uh, I know all over the world. Uh, the uh, old age is a challenge. So in a nursing home with um, uh, a number of uh, um, residents and caregivers, um, uh, typically in the developed world, um, caregiving is a scarce uh, resource. Um, so if that can be done um, with smart infrastructure, maybe some ambient uh, machines and sensors and so on, and then robots, and then for the remaining 10% of the cases, so the robot um, along with the uh, ambient infrastructure will know when to call a human expert and then they can come in for uh, uh, the right uh, complex tasks to uh, help the robot or maybe to reset some things uh, and so on and so forth. So that could be uh, an interesting challenge. Likewise, an assistant for a patient with uh, dementia, um, again, you know, how do you evaluate it? Uh, it could be evaluated by uh, caregivers. Uh, it could be evaluated by uh, um, sort of some uh, experts in the field and so on. So we need to get to uh, um, some objective measure, 90% uh, satisfaction rate, um, better than uh, sort of uh, a set of humans um, that were previously doing the task, for instance, and so on. Um, the third challenge in the health category we outlined is uh, a wearable device, which can provide uh, alerts. Now, there are a lot of Fitbit-like uh, devices uh, today, but this would be uh, a significant change uh, from where we are today, uh, which can provide, uh, in terms of an emergency, auto uh, summoning uh, an ambulance calling uh, 911 here in the U.S. or 999, I think, in some countries. Uh, but I think getting the you don't want um, too many alerts. You don't want too many uh, um, calls uh, because the ambulances tend to be a critical resource. So uh, accurate uh, provision of um, um, these um, diagnoses, if you will, uh, is important, um, realizing the criticality of the uh, uh, patient and so on. Then let's segue to uh, the uh, wealth uh, category. So there are, uh, it could be thought of as uh, a, um, an omnibus financial assistant, or um, we've broken it down into uh, three um, um, significant ones, sort of a thrift assistant, which automatically goes through your uh, monthly payments. So the problem currently is if you have a mortgage, you want to refinance, or you have a certain um, automobile insurance provider, and you want to change, there's a lot of data entry that's necessitated uh, the make and model of the car or uh, what's the value of your house, how much is the uh, mortgage payment remaining and so on. A lot of that information is already there with your bank or with your prior uh, uh, auto insurance provider or in your email somewhere. So uh, having these, uh, um, having this set of information automatically be uh, entered into a form. So ideally it would be one of your e-agents negotiating with an e-agent on the uh, uh, insurance company side or the uh, mortgage broker side, if you will. And this needs to happen in the background. You get an alert saying, aha, I have found you this month uh, a lower payment. Here are sort of the changes, uh, if you will. This is not an A-plus rated uh, insurance company. Uh, maybe it's A- minus, but you're saving 22%. And if you uh, agree, um, then um, I'll uh, uh, come back to you with uh, some electronic documents to sign. So very uh, low friction associated with these transactions and a lot of these things happen behind the uh, background um, and behind in the background, if you will. Um, likewise, uh, another uh, thing we could be thinking about is a benefits assistant. And we saw a lot of stimulus payments last year that governments provided. There was a lot of friction in getting the um, it benefits uh, to the hands of the people who really uh, needed them for uh, everyday uh, uh, grocery shopping or paying rent and so on. In some cases, paper checks were sent out, uh, they were lost, uh, many deserving people didn't get them. So uh, on the one hand, you want to avoid fraud, waste and abuse, uh, so you need checks, but you also need uh, 
if you sign a push from the government or from your uh, employer to um, the uh, folks who are going to be using these uh, features. Um, so that's, I, I think, uh, an interesting, uh, you know, and even for people with limited uh, digital uh, infrastructure, so if they are unbanked, uh, then you'd have to uh, send them to their uh, wallets or provide them uh, um, certain uh, um, QR codes or some other things that can then be uh, used um, uh, at the grocery store or to pay your landlord uh, and so on. Again, it's taking the friction out of the system. Savings assistant, likewise, you know, you may have uh, certain goals like college education, retirement, uh, uh, wedding, honeymoon, and then um, um, automatically saving towards those, alerting you when uh, you're not um, tracking the desired trajectory you've set up and then the AI can also provide hints in terms of uh, what can be done if there are some seasonal patterns it can say you know you're spending over the uh, summer is a little higher maybe you want to save a little less and then in the winter uh, when you're not traveling or doing other things you could be saving a little bit more so again providing that uh, uh, assistance in a facile fashion could be an interesting uh, challenge task. I think there are a lot of fintech companies now working towards pieces of these. They need to be assembled into this sort of larger vision, into this larger uh, goal is my uh, sense there. And then segueing to uh, wisdom, there are some very interesting uh, challenges um, that we can think about. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, being a, a plaintiff or being a defendant, I don't know uh, which is going to be easier. So on the one hand, you have to uh, be aware of all of the um, you know, case laws, if you will. I'm not a lawyer, but I know there are a lot of uh, uh, folks working on these sort of things. Um, interestingly, I talked to uh, a gentleman who is one of the uh, debating champions. I think he's debated by the AMS um, AI. Uh, under the context of uh, Project Debater, and he had some interesting thoughts, uh, which if we have time, I can uh, get to uh, um, later on. But I think um, uh, providing that legal uh, help is interesting. There are, again, apps like Do Not Pay, which uh, help you automatically uh, fight a, a parking ticket or a speeding ticket or get back some money from uh, a provider like the airline uh, if you uh, or do a refund because a uh, flight was canceled or you were downgraded or instead of taking a non-stop, you were forced to take a uh, flight with a connection uh, and so on. But do not pay is something uh, you folks can um, look up. Um, the next one is one of my uh, favorite challenge tasks, uh, winning the New Yorker um, cartoon caption contest, because not only um, do you need some image understanding capabilities, you need some clever linguistic capabilities, and then you need to be... Uh, aware of um, <clears throat> what makes things um, humorous, um, right? So I think that could be a, a very interesting um, task uh, when completed and you want to be able to do it multiple times and you want to do it with explanation in the sense if you have a colleague or if you have a child uh, that asks, um, you know, why is that funny? I didn't get the joke. Um, so, you know, you should be, uh, the AI should be able to sort of explain that. Uh, in terms of information checker, we talked about uh, the world is uh, awash in low quality information, fake news and so on. Um, can the uh, vintage, the authority, the metadata associated with the information be uh, used to uh, give comfort to somebody saying that this is uh, authoritative information and then even authoritative information like we've seen in the uh, COVID world, the treatment protocols or policy uh, protocols, uh, travel, other um, things, they keep changing. So you want to be able to provide up-to-date, reliable information, um, but providing that ability for a consumer of the information to be uh, uh, trusting of the information, I think is a, uh, is a very interesting uh, challenge. And then a meta challenge is, um, from the uh, ethics um, uh, category, um, convincing um, a human or convincing another uh, um, AI the system is interacting with um, and arguing that it's being fair and ethical in the decision-making. And then I, I um, look upon um, 
when I look in the mirror, right, uh, sometimes we say, oh, you know, for a friend or a colleague or maybe a family member, um, we didn't treat them well the last time. So maybe next time I should go over and beyond. So we do some reasoning, which is more of an integral over time. So each episode may not be uh, completely optimal, uh, fair and ethical. Um, uh, Herb Simon here, the uh, um, late Nobel laureate, used to talk about sort of this bound of rationality and people are sort of satisfying rather than being optimal, right? So each decision may be uh, um, satisfactory, but over time you may uh, sort of reflect on it and say, I need to uh, improve on these aspects uh, with respect to certain transactions. And those are, again, uh, uh, lessons for the AI system as well. Can it to do this meta level uh, analysis and say it's being fair and ethical uh, across a number of transactions over time. Let me segue to, uh, so we talked about sort of health, wealth and wisdom being the spheres. This is sort of the current state of um, AI and healthcare. Um, some interesting uh, things on the screen there on the top left hand side. I just recently came across this, uh, so I think it's brand new. It's uh, um, from a comment in um, Nature Medicine by Wu et al. They looked at the 130 FDA, which is sort of the regulatory uh, body uh, in the U.S. And U.S. versus um, Europe, there's a little bit of a difference, as I understand it. I think you can get a CE mark in Europe uh, uh, a little easily. And then it's uh, post-market uh, uh, surveillance and risk control. The FDA tends to be uh, a little more conservative here. But in any case, so they've approved uh, about 130 uh, medical AI devices. And this sort of tells you by uh, uh, anatomy, chest, breast, heart, et cetera, which ones have been approved. Some of them uh, refer to uh, multiple organs. And the um, um, they looked at it in terms of retrospective versus prospective. So there's um, very little prospective um, analysis or studies being done. Um, it's sort of approved. And then the uh, data collection going forward is not being monitored uh, adequately. Likewise, many of the retrospective studies were not multi-center, which means it could be biased if it was uh, one center. Um, the population there tends to be a little more uh, um, um, biased or constrained, if you will. So the key takeaway there was uh, do more uh, prospective studies, uh, make it multi-center, but I thought that was sort of uh, interesting. I was actually involved um, in a company in an advisory sense early on. Uh, they were one of the first companies to get uh, approval from the FDA for a second reader for mammograms. Uh, that's uh, now ICAD. It was a smaller company that got acquired by ICAD and is its, its nucleus uh, for uh, breast cancer diagnosis. Eric Topol has written a book called uh, Deep Medicine. I encourage uh, folks who are interested in this area to sort of read that. I think he lays out his vision for uh, how AI and uh, um, human experts should be uh, treating patients so a lot of um, machine-based stuff gets done in the background and then the human uh, doctor can spend more time uh, at the bedside if you will uh, with the patient and so on so the quality of care uh, improves quite a bit and this is um, an interesting uh, cartoon i guess for uh, two reasons one um, uh, i don't know whether you folks can read uh, it's a line uh, uh, you can see the bones they've consumed one doctor uh, it says, I still have room for a second opinion. Um, so, uh, you know, second opinions are really interesting uh, in uh, the um, uh, AI and healthcare field. Um, you know, can the AI be the uh, second opinion or in some cases can be the uh, primary uh, opinion renderer? And this cartoon also gets me back to the earlier challenge problem, right? Uh, um, how do you... Uh, recognize the humor in it so uh, at both levels i thought uh, this cartoon is uh, interesting so moving right along uh, the uh, co-contributors of mine in that ai magazine article they addressed uh, slightly different dimensions so frank chen from andreessen horowitz uh, the top uh, venture capital firm here on the west coast he talked quite a bit about being better together and by that uh, he meant teaming 
right? Everybody's talked about uh, improving AI. They've sort of, um, their mantra is uh, software is uh, eating the world, right? So uh, can, uh, uh, my twist to that is uh, sort of, can software be uh, treating the world? Can smart software be uh, making the uh, um, earth a better place, right? Uh, given today uh, is Earth Day, and that's a good theme. But uh, Frank primarily talked about uh, um, can a human plus an AI be a better judge, be a better uh, lawyer, be a better uh, physician, etc. And then Steve Cross um, talks about, uh, you folks can read it in the article, the ready test uh, for teams, again, uh, not uh, really uh, making sure that uh, you're able to, uh, uh, the machine's able to necessarily uh, fool a uh, human uh, person who is testing it, but uh, um, providing kudos to the uh, machine um, because, uh, you know, it's uh, providing uh, um, superhuman uh, abilities and then also being part of the team. So he set up uh, something that he calls the uh, ready test as a uh, as an evolution of the Turing test, if you will. And then Tom Khalil, who's part of uh, Schmidt Futures, uh, founded by Eric Schmidt, uh, the ex-CEO of Google, talks about work, workforce reskilling. And he had proposed all of this pre-pandemic, but I think last year we sort of saw that. And I think we'll see that as uh, people return to the workforce uh, after the pandemic, it's going to be a very different work environment. I think there's going to be a lot of hybrid um, working, uh, both in terms of uh, using more digital tools, video conferencing, if you will, but I think the amount of automation in the uh, workforce is also uh, increasing. So people need to be uh, uh, skilled or uh, reskilled to work in that sort of um, human machine uh, teams, if you will. And it's not blue collar or white collar anymore. Um, I like to use the phrase no collar, right? I mean, we've all been sitting at home uh, these days, uh, not wearing a collar, even though I guess I'm wearing one uh, today. Many people are in their uh, um, you know, blouses, sweatshirts, um, what have you. So these sort of no collar jobs, uh, which sort of blur the uh, uh, boundary between uh, the old blue and white and making sure that again, you're teaming with machines, you're teaming with other humans who may be remote, makes it interesting. Tom also specifically calls out um, healthcare cost reduction. I think he had some numbers. Can you save uh, 5 billion, 10 billion in certain segments? Because uh, the US healthcare costs uh, are a um, runaway affair, right? That's one of the things we need to get things under control here. So that's an interesting uh, challenge call. Um, from uh, the University of Pittsburgh, actually, one of these, my uh, wife, I know Marco is also uh, you know, married to an AI person, so likewise, uh, we're a couple. Uh, she talked about a parent aid and institutional budgeting. She also has a definition for AI um, in the article. Francisca, um, who is the uh, president-elect of uh, AAAI, so I really uh, appreciated her uh, viewpoint. She's an IBM fellow. Uh, focusing on ethics, she talked about the uh, ethics switch uh, again in terms of, you know, can you build these things ahead of time when you design some AI to do a task? Is there an ethics switch there? So there's that constant monitoring and maybe even turning off some of the decision making, be it treating patients, be it uh, approving a loan and so on. So that constant uh, internal internally consistent monitoring, if you will. And Ken Stanley had a very interesting take. Uh, he was talking about sort of open-endedness because there are going to be new problems, new data. We again saw that last year with the pandemic and so on. So open-endedness could be thought of as a uh, meta challenge as well. Uh, if you will, he's a research manager at uh, OpenAI. So uh, very interesting perspective from him. Uh, and after we sort of put the article out, I've gotten feedback from uh, a number of folks, uh, chatted with uh, Eric Horwitz, who is sort of the chief scientist at um, Microsoft. He said, I had put forth some uh, uh, challenge problems as part of a panel in uh, 1996. So he sent me that. I have a link to that. Uh, it's on his uh, website. So he had talked about uh, uh, uncertainty and reasoning under uncertainty and so on, some interesting challenges. I think on the same panel, there were folks like Tom Mitchell, who's here at CMU, and then um, 
Uh, I think Rodney Brooks was on that panel. You folks can read about it. Uh, so some really interesting uh, challenges there. And a lot of it, one of the things Eric mentioned was I'm still working on those challenges from uh, 25 years ago. So none of those are fully solved problems. And then I had email communication with the uh, recent Turing Award winner, uh, Joshua Belgio. And he said at a high level, he thinks about climate change, pathogen resistance. But then at a tactical level, there are these method goals, right? Out of distribution, generalization, uh, unobserved uh, uh, causal concept discovery. And uh, so part of that is sort of this abductive reasoning, which not many people talk about. Uh, uh, today, for instance, I go out and uh, see that my lawn is wet. A reasonable uh, um, conclusion is uh, that it probably uh, rained uh, overnight, but it's not a perfect uh, the other way, if it rains, my lawn's wet. But uh, if my uh, lawn's wet, making that uh, um, conclusion that it rained is uh, abductive because there are other things that could have uh, happened. Uh, the sprinkler system or uh, my child could have been uh, playing with water and so on. But just realizing what are the uh, relative probabilities and humans sort of bring that common sense. So it makes it sort of really uh, interesting combining all of that. Uh, uh, the National Academy of Engineering here on their website has some grand challenges. The NSF and so on communicated with a VP of um, research at one of the universities um, on the West Coast uh, who had also seen our article. And he said the NSF has been thinking about sort of grand challenges, collaborating with the NIH and so on. The Department of Energy here last year put out, because uh, DARPA has been doing grand challenges for a while, including for the uh, self-driving vehicles and so on. Those are some of the more uh, high profile ones over the last uh, few decades with the Department of Energy uh, stole a uh, page from DARPA's book and they put out some things last year. I don't know what the status of that is. And then uh, on uh, uh, Earth Day, I think, um, the uh, proclamation from uh, UN Secretary General uh, Guterres is about uh, limiting global temperature uh, rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So I thought that's uh, an interesting uh, challenge, uh, uh, literally uh, hot off the press, if you will. Um, a physician acquaintance of mine, this is probably uh, the most thought-provoking uh, feedback we have gotten. He um, happens to uh, have a um, special needs uh, child. Uh, who has cerebral palsy, so uh, communication is difficult, uh, but they think he understands them uh, very well. So he was asking about how uh, AI can help uh, special needs individuals. I think uh, we haven't done enough as a community, so that could be uh, something uh, very interesting. There used to be a quality of life uh, technologies um, center here at CMU, I think, um, uh, some of those uh, activities uh, have wrapped up primarily uh, probably because of uh, you know, funding being uh, throttled a little bit. Uh, but I think um, AI for uh, uh, special needs is a very interesting uh, broad area as well. Likewise, uh, prizes, uh, the cross-pollination effects, uh, we talked about progress towards uh, one goal, uh, helping other goals. Uh, those are all interesting things to keep in mind and prizes could be uh, sponsored by uh, NGOs, could be sponsored by governments or uh, corporations, making it uh, interesting. And when I think of an AI project, uh, I think of it as a triad, there's the data, uh, and we'll get to some traditional and alternative data. Can you be clever about uh, um, and I know Marco works uh, with uh, sentiment data, a lot of the uh, uh, data from Bloomberg around markets and so on, especially in the financial markets, there's a big push towards the alternative data, i.e. things that are not coming from the stock exchanges or the companies, but it's monitoring uh, shipping lanes, shipping traffic, monitoring parking lots, monitoring blogs for whether a product is being uh, well received in the marketplace, what are the Instagram influencers saying, what is the uh, uh, credit card spending data saying on an aggregate and so on. Domain knowledge tends to be very uh, important. In fact, the tools are fairly mature. Now we have a broad spectrum of them from uh, traditional statistical to uh, deep learning. So using the right data, with the right domain knowledge tends to be uh, very interesting. I wrote a little uh, a piece um, a couple of years ago um, for one of the uh, publications in India called Made in India AI. 
uh, because somebody asked, uh, what does um, it mean? Um, and so we were there talking about uh, using or the importance of local data and local domain knowledge. And I think that question came up at a um, master class that uh, Marco was at in uh, Bangalore. These are sort of uh, pictures from there. Uh, I thought he may appreciate it. Uh, it was um, roughly uh, 2017. And um, some of the discussions there at that uh, five-day workshop included um, national policies. I know uh, you folks are uh, thinking about uh, things at the OECD uh, level and Marco, you're on the national body there and so on. So uh, how should uh, folks be thinking about reskilling? And we had some good discussions with the um, late uh, Jaime Carbonell who was there. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, uh, last year. A uh, good friend and mentor of mine here. Uh, and Marco, Jaime and I had some uh, good discussions um, at this uh, workshop. So uh, I was sort of remembering that as I put this uh, um, talk together and I thought Marco may appreciate some of the pictures. Um, but also what we were talking about in terms of challenges builds on what uh, Jaime and Raj here um, tongue in cheek talk about the Bill of Rights, right? And by that, they mean getting the right information at the right granularity at the right time to the right person, right? So that's a challenge you are driving around, you have a GPS and so on in a busy uh, street corner, for instance, in uh, Bangalore, just sort of realizing where you need to turn, right? Sometimes if you take the wrong turn in that traffic, it takes you 10, 15 minutes to sort of um, uh, get back on track or uh, saying, you know, park here if you're headed to this meeting and so on. So at the right time, whispering sort of the right things uh, is uh, a very interesting uh, goal as well. So this is, uh, we talked about alternative data a little bit. So if you're thinking about data, domain knowledge, and then using the right tools, last year what we found out is there were significant changes in data. A lot of the data streams were off the charts, right? So some of them can actually give you um, these ESG sort of implications. We couldn't have run these experiments before last year, but on the left-hand panel, you got um, to see what the data would look like if you turned off a significant part of economic activity in many countries at the same time, right? So um, there is that um, carbon dioxide emission from aviation that's uh, depicted there, uh, 2020 versus 2019, sort of business activity. This is number of travelers passing through the TSA, the security checkpoint uh, in the um, uh, U.S. sort of um, seven-day average, we were running uh, um, one and a half to uh, two million before the pandemic. And I think we're slowly now getting back. I think what I was reading is we're uh, now well past the uh, one million number again on an average. So we're up to uh, uh, about half the traffic, I think, in terms of um, people flying, which again could be a, a barometer for larger uh, economic activity. Um, likewise, um, there are streams that are available that get you uh, um, hints on uh, the uh, discretionary spending, restaurants uh, and travel and so on. So uh, air travel muted, but Airbnb and related uh, traffic um, is higher compared to uh, the baseline. Likewise, um, on the left-hand panel on the restaurants, you can see uh, some of the more uh, um, sunny places um, like Miami and so on uh, have uh, opened up quite a bit. Pittsburgh and DC, I think, which tend to be colder. This is from uh, sort of uh, several weeks ago when it was still cold. So sort of their restaurant uh, spending was um, still uh, below benchmark, if you will. But these are interesting streams of alternative data that can be combined for economic activity prediction, which can have policy implications, but can have investment and stock market implications as well. Uh, novelty detection is sort of a very interesting building block towards these uh, challenges. This is some work with uh, uh, some others, including uh, Jaime, sort of how do you detect uh, a constant event versus uh, a new unobfuscated event. So it could be used for uh, uh, pandemic surveillance, it could be used for financial transactions, it could be used for uh, um, some things emerging uh, 
in the healthcare or the knowledge field, but I wanted to sort of put forth uh, novelty detection as an interesting uh, building block. And sometimes it is um, how you sort of frame the problem and what sort of data stream you look at. This is, an, again, an interesting example around one of the challenges in solving for these uh, bigger goals is uh, what I call the art of data science, if you will, right? It's not always deep learning or it's not always a nonlinear regression. You really need to uh, look at uh, interesting data streams that are already out there. This is sort of um, a picture uh, from the uh, US presidential elections. And what it shows you is the betting markets. What was interesting to me was, um, as you can see, the blue and the red line. So the blue is the Biden contract, the red is the Trump contract. The expectation going into early November was that Biden was ahead. Um, and even as the polls closed, that was the expectation. Um, and then there was a lot of volatility overnight because of how the absentee ballots and the uh, um, the in-person ballots were counted and so on. So that created a lot of confusion, so much so that when you woke up on the uh, fourth morning, the day after the election, it was really unclear um, on the East Coast. If you woke up at 6.30 or 7 a.m., uh, you could turn on the news, you could read some of the uh, um, online news or some blogs. It was still unclear to... Uh, uh, even some knowledgeable people I talked later, they said, yeah, it took 15, 20, 25 minutes to sort of get to uh, what the state of the race was. And then later on that morning, somebody pointed me to the uh, uh, betting markets chart, which told you in one chart what the answer was. So essentially, the Biden contract had already rallied to uh, roughly 75 cents um, by the morning of the uh, fourth. So again, a very interesting example of... Um, a simple chart or a simple data stream that can get you the right answer instead of something uh, uh, more complicated like deep learning or um, any of the other techniques. So I just wanted to use that as an illustration there. And this also gets me to the broader uh, theme of, um, you know, in the old days, um, it was, you know, you would get on the uh, cover of science for a new element or a new uh, vaccine or something like that. But over the last um, couple of years, what we have seen is we have seen people thinking about this machine science, right? So the cover of science was this uh, uh, poker uh, superhuman capabilities that was featured a couple of years ago. And then uh, nature machine intelligence uh, had uh, uh, some overview papers on uh, how do you characterize machine science? So understanding machine behavior and understanding machine science sort of helps with this teaming again. How can humans and machines team? They have different strengths. Uh, so we're getting into the theory of that. Then I uh, like to think about the uh, world's building blocks as sort of atoms, bits, and cells, right? So different friction if you want to move something from Asia to Europe or Asia to uh, uh, the U.S., if it's uh, an iPhone, if it's a, uh, uh, a gadget, uh, it takes um, time, it takes money, while if it's um, bits, it's information, like we're doing this conference, it's instantaneous, and likewise with cells, you get into uh, you know, ethical issues and so on. So the velocity of innovation is a little different. Bits are informing innovation now in atoms, uh, innovation in cells but there are some significant uh, issues. And when it comes to uh, uh, ethics, again, these things tend to be uh, a little different. Uh, there are a couple of high profile things over the last few years. Um, on the top is somebody who was uh, wrongly uh, accused by an algorithm, uh, facial recognition, uh, and he spent time in jail um, he was innocent. It was uh, an error by the algorithm. Now, humans make mistakes as well, but this is sort of a debate that's going on with respect to facial recognition. And I was reading that uh, the EU is tightening up their uh, facial recognition use cases as well. I actually have a um, slightly contrarian perspective because in the US, the Second Amendment, uh, which uh, uh, is the right to own guns, right? So uh, that tends to be a little more of an issue. So you have um, 
a policeman showing up with guns as opposed to a detective using facial recognition. So I think the trade-offs are a little different. So I think for many of the use cases, I would uh, rather have a detective using uh, facial recognition rather than a policeman uh, showing up with guns. We had the high-profile case where the policeman was just um, convicted, right? In the uh, George Floyd case, I think the outcome there would have been a little different uh, if uh, we were just using uh, facial recognition. So that's a longer and more nuanced conversation, but it also depends on some of the cultural background and some of the other things is sort of my point there. But those are very interesting and topical issues that need to be uh, addressed. Likewise, um, I was reading that uh, China's uh, CRISPR twins, um, I think they were trying to get them protected against HIV, I believe. But I think one of the effects uh, was their uh, brains apparently inadvertently were enhanced, but we don't know what other negative effects uh, they've had and so on. Um, wasn't uh, well thought out, the regulations aren't uh, uh, well formed yet. Uh, so those are some things to be seriously uh, thinking about. How can we get this right? Maybe we'll get uh, some things wrong, but we need to have a lot of debate. We need to have a lot of uh, data-oriented uh, policy, data-informed policy to get these things approximately right. We'll never uh, get them right uh, fully. And this is an interesting uh, paper from, I think, last year in uh, Nature Communications um, on how they took it, they took a look at all the uh, uh, sustainable development goals and said, um, is um, AI uh, having a positive impact? Can it have a positive uh, impact? These are uh, things like um, looking at reducing, for instance, child labor, looking at uh, making sure there's gender parity, making sure there is sort of clean water. And it uh, sort of turns out that, uh, you know, having data centers, you know, there might be some things that are uh, uh, not, uh, fully positive. Some of them may have negative impact. So, uh, you know, you've got to sort of trade off the positive impact from the, uh, with the negative impact, much like we're seeing with the vaccines, right? There are side effects uh, potentially with some uh, vaccines, but the uh, uh, good significant, the benefits significantly outweigh the uh, uh, side effects and maybe even the side effects, if you know what the context is, that can be uh, further minimized and so on. So this is a very good way of um, looking at uh, the potential contributions of AI and then also doing uh, risk minimization. Folks can sort of look this up. I don't want to uh, spend too much time here. And in terms of one of the things that uh, as we uh, thought about these grand challenges and how to uh, uh, accomplish them and also some of uh, Reddy's challenges from uh, 1988, right? So there were 30 years and all of those challenges weren't accomplished. And the reason they weren't accomplished is this focus on narrow AI, right? Uh, so AI is able to do very well in certain uh, narrow tasks, extracting sentiment from news articles, uh, um, looking at uh, radiology images and giving you uh, hints or even some uh, absolute values in terms of um, um, the uh, uh, suspicious areas in a uh, uh, mammogram, if you will. Uh, but, you know, that same program um, cannot do other general purpose things. Uh, in, in fact, a few years ago, even in the chess context, I'd say it's very hard for a, um, because when you play chess with uh, very young kids, one of the things you're watching for is, you know, they tend to be a little uh, um, jittery. Um, they end up upsetting the game board or the chess board, right? So, uh, you know, having a robot that has uh, the fine motor skills so the robots can actually do that pretty well, but if you, you know, have a, a different chessboard, um, uh, I don't know what the generality is of the uh, current uh, robots and so on to actually play the game, right? Physically move the uh, pieces and so on without upsetting the uh, um, chessboard and so on. So this general purpose AI, when we uh, sort of think about, and this is sort of um, yeah, thoughts in progress, work in progress, you can, uh, and I'm just thinking out loud here, um, maybe the bottom layer needs to consist of sort of deep learning, 
um, along with uh, reinforcement learning. And deep learning is very good at implying features. It's good for fast reflexive reasoning on the perceptual side, on the motor system side. So for developing things like muscle memory or recognizing things like the human visual system does and you know immediately sort of reacting to certain things. But this higher level reasoning, which may include language, right? Like in humans, animals don't necessarily use language. There's some debate there, maybe dolphins and some animals, um, you know, are using more um, language and sounds than we think or we know about. But in any case, there is this perceptual grounding, right? We're all able to uh, have this conversation. We're able to uh, learn from, you know, we've not seen a unicorn, we can picture a unicorn or one of the examples from um, Stephen Harnard uh, from years ago is, you know, you can train a system uh, or a child um, understands what a horse is, um, understands what the pattern stripe is, and then you can say, you show pictures, there's that perceptual grounding of a horse of the striped pattern, and then in language alone, you can say a zebra is a striped horse, or even just a striped animal, and you know the um, human gets the image in their head, they don't need to necessarily see a zebra and so on. So that's what we mean by perceptual grounding, I think that's important. And then the higher level reasoning, um, in terms of if you're doing it, in when somebody uh, says, you know, uses a, a figures of speech, uh, a, a new product, if it's compared to sort of a Tesla or Apple, that probably then means that it's a high quality product, has uh, a, uh, a new age or uh, advanced capability and so on. So we sort of understand that at the level of language. So I think that high level reasoning and then teaming, the ideal teams will be multi-human, multi-machine, but humans and machines don't communicate in the same language. So having this sort of human-machine lingua franca, I think is gonna be important. So that's sort of the emerging stack potentially to get to general purpose AI. And then you need to be using alternative data. We talked about that a little bit. And this proactive intelligence is what additional data can I collect? We had an IR project uh, called exactly that paint pro for proactive intelligence. Um, they were looking at it from a um, uh, homeland security angle. Should they send a drone out to collect additional information? Can they send a human out? Uh, the human can collect more information, but then the danger is uh, that the human can get captured or even killed, right? If they go into enemy uh, territory and so on. And from a business uh, or uh, everyday use case standpoint, what is the cost of getting additional information that can add to your, um, and there's that network effect in data that people don't talk about. So you have sort of seven features or seven columns of data. Sometimes an eighth column or an eighth feature comes in and sort of completes the jigsaw puzzle that eighth uh, feature alone may not have been valuable, but in the context of these other seven becomes very really, uh, interesting and valuable. Likewise, so ensemble of data, ensemble of techniques, uh, because there are some techniques that may be uh, working well on a certain slice of the data or for certain populations and so on. So how do you sort of combine them, get them and so on. There has been already a lot of research, but I think uh, combining uh, different uh, methods uh, using different data could be very interesting. And then there is also a trade-off, you know, people talk about XAI explanations explanations may not always be necessary. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, if you can build trust, if a machine that you're working much like with a colleague, right? Uh, if it's a new colleague, you may ask them more, uh, um, you may have more of a conversation, why do you want to do this uh, and so on. Uh, but once you get into a good working relationship, you trust your colleague, you trust a family member, much like, uh, you know, a child often sort of trusts uh, early on uh, uh, a parent. Now we have teenagers in the household or a teenager in the household, right? Then they start questioning whatever. Uh, so it's sort of interesting how this trade-off between trust and explanation is, and that should be used um, in creating the right teaming architectures. Likewise, ethics and isonomy, uh, isonomy is being sort of egalitarian and fair. And ethics, we talked about it earlier, it could be over time, it could be over larger populations and so on that 
uh, you are making some uh, not necessarily strong statements, weak statements that uh, on an average, uh, these human machine teams are being um, ethical over uh, time and over populations and so on. Maybe that's a good way to, uh, because there's no uh, definition for uh, fairness uh, that everybody has agreed upon uh, as well. Uh, and likewise, I, I think, uh, um, you know, some people say Moore's law um, has already come to an end, but I think we're going to get uh, a tailwind from quantum computing. There's a lot of um, new progress in uh, behavioral science. And last year, we sort of used to joke about it here, but I think that it's uh, arguably valid. What was the most important science in uh, US in 2020? It was arguably political science, right? Because we had uh, some very interesting uh, uh, polarization. We had the uh, government that uh, under fog of war conditions obviously uh, was doing uh, uh, some strange things. So I, I think the strangeness was around uh, um, realizing the uh, um, enormity of the pandemic uh, on the testing side, but then on the vaccine side, uh, there was a lot of progress, uh, but a lot of politics got into it. Uh, so these behavioral science elements uh, may be very interesting. And we've seen that in the stock market as well with the uh, GameStop uh, saga. It's the, uh, the flow, it's how humans behave that can move markets, that can hence uh, have uh, significant uh, ramifications in society. So you want to be combining uh, uh, AI with quantum computing and behavioral science in an effort to get to general purpose AI in an effort to uh, solving uh, a lot of the challenges um, we've outlined. I want to end with, uh, you know, this is one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, pictures. This is the Red Queen in um, uh, Through the Looking Glass uh, telling Alice, uh, now here you see it takes all the running you can do. Uh, to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, uh, you must run uh, at least twice as fast as that. Um, that's what we need to do to uh, get to uh, the answers to some of these uh, challenges. So uh, I hope um, this was uh, thought provoking. That was my uh, goal with this, uh, Marco. Uh... Ganesh, uh, thanks. Uh, this was really great uh, 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 talk. I mean, with many insights, which, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm thinking every day about this, many of these issues, right? Uh, also, these projections for 2020s, right, which you put, um, I think they are, uh, some are valid, actually, some, not sure if we can reach uh, one element, I think, which um, it's important, um, I'm not sure how far did you go in the discussions with uh, all these colleagues which uh, you consulted. Uh, <clears throat> so each problem which, uh, or each challenge, task, right, which we, uh, we are projecting in the future has some consequences in the technology or what we can do. And um, yeah, this was a really good point uh, saying, okay, we all know what we have today is mostly this narrow AI. And on the other side, um, um, you have this general purpose AI, or sometimes I, I call this broad AI, because it's uh, certainly uh, something which is a little bit more holistic uh, as compared to uh, just uh, complex but narrow problems, right? And uh, especially I like that uh, last section where you... Uh, uh, mentioned the wisdom problems, right? The wisdom problems. They all require uh, some kind of common sense. Mm -hmm. AI surprised us mm -hmm. or is still surprising us in many ways that there are so many interesting solutions uh, in a very, very, in a very shallow layer below the, uh, uh, just the, the, the top, right? And <clears throat> deep learning is kind of exploiting the shallow, uh, sh uh, uh, shallow solutions. Still, a little bit deeper, right? But not too much. But uh, some of the problems which you mentioned, like the legal one, right, or or this uh, 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 cartoon one, cartoon challenge, and so on. So for some of those, you really need to understand the world, right? Uh, it's not enough just to. Um, 
well, count the words or um, uh, count the collocations, correlations, and so on, and uh, boost them uh, through, I don't know, five, 10, 100 layers, right? And uh, maybe, maybe there is a solution. But so could you comment on that? So this holistic approach, right, uh, uh, which, uh, which requires some kind of world understanding, so some kind of world model in the back, right? And this common sense reasoning where things cannot be internally materialized, right, uh, as we are used to these days, um, versus, let's say, non-materialized -mat um, uh, data so that we can infer things which are not that uh, obvious, right? Could you comment this uh, uh, shallow, uh, a little bit deeper versus common sense, right, which would be a little bit more holistic, right, uh, together with the context, right? The world model is the keyword here, right? No, no, makes sense. I, I think you've provided um, either the answers or hints to answers in your uh, question, uh, Marco. I think you and I uh, see the world uh, the uh, same way. I think deep learning is um, um, uh, very good. Uh, as Jonathan Swift said, uh, vision is the art of seeing the invisible, right? So actually, when you talk to clinicians, they're now saying that AI is able to see things um, in a radiology image. Likewise, maybe I think with the self-driving cars, we'll get to, I mean, a lot of the times now we have older family members who say, oh, I'm having trouble uh, uh, driving in the rain or driving at night or whatever, right? So they will give you features that then can assist you, right? Uh, if uh, a, um, uh, I, I think I was just reading uh, um, a Tesla car would always break, uh, Uh, in a certain area, and then they found out that uh, there was a huge billboard there with a stop sign you know, on the in the billboard, right? So humans, maybe the one you, know, you would never break, uh, but one that you may get distracted, um, you know, if uh, there's a cool image on the billboard. So humans react differently to stimuli. Um, so those are important, and I think getting to again, no. Um, Uh, monopoly on terminology, right? So common sense uh, tasks, uh, this broad AI. And again, we are all um, a function of our experiences, right? So again, uh, you know, after having spent um, uh, time out west in the US, I actually have trouble crossing the street in Bangalore or in an Indian city, right? Because uh, I hesitate too much. The traffic actually is moving um at lower speed but there's a lot of stimuli right so these days it probably takes me three times the amount of time to cross the street uh when i go back to an emerging uh, market than when i was when, as a teen not because my motor skills have uh, slowed down but it's there's a lot of computation going on so i think yeah come, having that world model and the world model now is um learned using your experience, your data, right? And that's where some of this bias, and if you haven't worked with machines before, if you haven't worked, and we've seen that people, you know, um, sometimes when you work with colleagues from other cultures, you know, initially, uh, um, again, depending on your personality, you are uh, uh, either a little overly polite or overly cautious or uh, uh, so on. So those are some things. And again, the average worker now is going to be working with a lot more machines. Uh, and I think having this common sense, the legal one, one of my favorite examples is you're in a courtroom and you suddenly see a snake or the fire alarm goes off or whatever, right? We have enough common sense reasoning. And then if there's a criminal or whatever on trial, the the security people will try to, uh, you know, have that uh, person be um, confined, but everybody else can run out. And then, you know, the expectation is if it's uh, just an alarm, a drill, you know, they would congregate back in 30 minutes or 45 minutes and so on. But an AI system would get terribly confused uh, with a fire alarm or with a snake or uh, you know something that uh, is not expected yeah um, very good example i mean this uh, crossing the road in uh, in india i think uh, uh, all of us experience this because uh, uh, you need to uh, let me express myself in these ai terms first you need to develop the representation right so the the, the uh, construct the features so that you can this 
uh, that so eventually that you you can cross the road uh, uh, safely. This is a very good example, I think. Uh, yeah, so I also like uh, the comment from Joshua Benjo, right? So this latent uh, causal concept uh, uh, discovery, right? So I think this is one of the... Uh, so before we talked about this, okay, world model, okay, fine. Uh, still, we were more or less in sort of static uh, static problems. Uh, but um, as, soon, as soon as you have like um, the examples from health, which are all close to real time or very real time, right? Um, and uh, and this could be expanded not just from digital assistance or robotic assistance, also to uh, more complex systems, right? I don't know, like uh, uh, manufacturing plant or, or traffic, uh, village, city, right? Even a country, right? So the concept of the digital twins, right? Which um, actually they need to have the the either develop or they need to be sort of this the hybrid versions of digital twins have uh, partly handmade and partly trained uh, uh, model of the world uh, uh, which can uh, of course respond to very complex questions right so the dynamical element right uh, the real-time element of of the systems this is something which um, maybe it was a little bit neglected in the last uh, five ten years uh, during this deep learning for obvious reasons right uh, uh, but in your examples, uh, this dynamicity actually appeared uh, a lot, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think creating the digital um, uh, twin, I'm, I'm no biology expert, but I think they are only close to creating digital twins for very small organisms. And even there, even within a cell, right, uh, there are so many things um, going on. There is physics, chemistry, um, and uh, biological functions, right? I don't think we understand uh, even for uh, very simple organisms all the uh, interactions. Now, some of the challenges that uh, have been uh, accomplished are this sort of uh, uh, protein folding task, um, then finding sort of an antibiotic, I think, halicin, uh, whatever. So there's the building blocks are emerging, but I think having that digital uh, twin, maybe it'll be at a more abstract level, uh, will be very, um, very interesting. And that'll sort of solve this current uh, conundrum, right? Um, the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines have a tiny bit of risk. What sort of people um, is that risk? Um, higher end, right? So then they can be easily screened. You give them uh, a different vaccine or you say, no, you uh, will be given the vaccine, but I think you need to be uh, maybe admitted in the hospital or whatever, right? Uh, whatever the right answer is. It's uh, such a small enough number, but you need to uh, um, have them screened the right way. And I think the um, digital twin would be a, a great way to uh, get to that. And uh, the last question, uh, which will be some kind of transition to the next talk, um, uh, which will be on uh, quantum computing, right? So you mentioned quantum computing. In a way, from our AI perspective, right, quantum computing could be said like it's kind of a warp, warp speed uh, optimization machine, right? Uh, and since AI, it's mostly based on a, some kind of optimization, right? Uh, uh, so this uh, this may cause big disruption right uh, in many ways um, um, I guess uh, in many positive ways but also uh, I'm sure there will be some negative effects as well because of this uh, kind of change fairly disruptive change which seems like it's coming and we will in the next talk we'll hear uh, from Krista uh, um, uh, where let's say Microsoft is standing there so uh, what kind of discussion do you have discussions you had with uh, some of uh, the colleagues which you mentioned, uh, from Eric to Joshua and uh, 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 others, right, uh, <clears throat> on quantum computing. Is this like elephant in the room still, uh, where we don't want to talk about this too much yet? Or is this like, uh, is there some kind of understanding on this? Yeah, I didn't talk to them specifically about um, uh, quantum computing, but there's a lot of work. Actually, Pittsburgh um, is emerging now as a, a center for uh, 
um, some quantum algorithms and so on. So, uh, and I have a, a colleague and a friend who has done a lot of work in terms of um, the whole optimization, but he's really thinking about sort of integer programming and those sorts of things. So again, those are simpler problems, but if I were to, and I, I don't know enough uh, about quantum computing, but my vision is that we will have one, we obviously get the benefit of speed, which is important. And, um, you know, it remains to be seen whether some of these um, NP complete problems, right? I mean, they have said even the approximate uh, solutions are hard enough, but I think we have as humans, right? We are not, the traffic was a good one, likewise sort of deciding what to eat or whatever. We have a lot of, um, um, uh, the search space is potentially fairly, large, but we make some quick decisions, right? So there are soft constraints and there are hard constraints, right? So I'm a, a vegetarian, for instance, so I go to a restaurant, whatever. So I immediately, I know what my hard constraints are and it's pretty quick. And if I'm rushing to a talk or to a meeting, right? Then, you know, I, I know um, the first thing I can get without standing in line is what I would get it. So those sort of, I, I think it seems like we may be able to do a lot more what if analysis, by relaxing the constraints. And now, uh, since again, it's Earth Day, so to me, uh, a tensor problem set up, you know, one of the dimensions would be different countries or regions because policies, again, go by countries, regions, and so on. But then gases and some of the environment, right, they don't follow regional boundaries. Um, then you get to, uh, you know, the other dimensions would be, um, uh, sort of people, economic activity. Um, and if you can run some very rich set of simulations that sort of um, informs us so you can um, freeze the hard constraints, but you can play with the soft constraints and so on. I, I think that uh, solution set, the ability to visualize and talk um, intelligently with other, you know, so the president of the US can talk to some EU leaders and say, this is what we need to get to, right? Uh, and those simulations may be interesting. That's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Ganesh. It was really a great talk. Uh, also, the feedback which I'm getting um, uh, these back channels is um, uh, extremely positive uh, because it was uh, it's not easy to get, you know, a person which would really uh, analytically talk about the uh, uh, future and uh, in a structured way. And this was um, uh, uh, at the moment when I spotted your uh, recent article, uh, I said, well, we need this, right? Uh, so thanks again for uh, this uh, talk. And now uh, we will transition to uh, Krista, which uh, in a way uh, will focus on one of these elements um, uh, on quantum computing, uh, uh, which you pointed out as well as uh, one of the extremely strong uh, future topics, right? And uh, let me say uh, just a few words about uh, Krista and Ganesh, sorry, because of uh, slight confusion, I didn't make uh, the... Uh, into that proper introduction uh, to you before, but uh, let's now uh, go ahead. Uh, so, Ganesh, thanks again, right? So, uh, yeah. uh, uh, so let me just uh, say a few words about Krista. Right? Uh, Krista is uh, general manager of quantum uh, systems at Microsoft, uh, and she leads a team of uh, uh, dedicated people, right, realizing a commercial scale quantum computing system in ecosystem. Uh, to solve today's unsolvable unsolvable problems, right? So this is very <clears throat> hard uh, sentence. Uh, before she has um, she had long history of uh, doing uh, various kinds of uh, uh, AI uh, within uh, Microsoft uh, uh, in 2018. So just uh, two three years ago, uh, Krista was named as one of the 39 most powerful women engineers according to B Business Insider. So. Uh, she's, I guess, the right person to talk uh, about this kind of topic. Uh, uh, she also got numerous of uh, awards, and uh, she's in all sorts of uh, boards, uh, plus tons of uh, papers and patents. I won't go too much in a uh, detail. Uh, detail. So, um, uh, Krista, uh, so uh, please uh, uh, tell tell the story. Is this elephant in the room still for AI people uh, or uh, are we closer or are we touching the elephant at least from some sites uh, based on the, that story? Krista, please. Great. Thank, thanks, Marco. Can everyone hear me okay? I hope and see, see the slides. 
Well, it's great to be here at the web conference. Um, as Marco explained, I have had, uh, I have previously worked, you know, much more closely uh, with uh, different web innovations, focusing really on, on uh, search and um, web search and advertising in the past, and now looking at how we can enhance different applications, really accelerate our world through quantum computing, right? Have quantum acceleration bringing about impact. And when we think about the elephant in the room, I would say that elephant is coming into view. Uh, we're starting to see the whole picture. We don't just see, you know, a, a local image anymore. We're, we're starting to see how it all fits together. And that's what I'm excited to share with all of you today. I want to talk about how we're enabling the quantum revolution, right? How are we enabling to see that whole elephant and, and what impact that elephant might have. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to share with you how we are pioneering not only at Microsoft, but across the community to bring about what we what I like to call quantum impact and how we're doing that at scale. So I'm sure many of you, you know, you've seen the press, right? You're reading the news articles. Are you ready for the quantum computing revolution? It's going to change everything, right? And we are in this race right now. And I want to peel that back, right? Really look at the details. What is it going to change? What areas will quantum help accelerate? Where will we see practical quantum advantage? And what impacts will that have? And I want to help, you know, really prepare all of you for this quantum revolution, which already, you know, already is here and starting today. Uh, and, and also really make an ask of all of you to bring forward your, your challenging problems, you know, help, help uh, step in and innovate uh, so that we can see even more impact coming from quantum acceleration. And with quantum computing, we're really working to redefine computing in some sense. We're really working to expand computing. What does it mean to compute? We, we want to take a different, uh, maybe enhanced view, you might say, uh, of how this accelerator can play a role in our heterogeneous computing fabric. You know, as was as you all know, today is Earth Day. What types of problems do we want to go after with quantum acceleration? Well, the impacts we seek to have can impact our world, our society, right? We're looking at helping improve how we can get to carbon negative footprints. How can we help improve food production, make it more efficient, less reliant on some of the world's very scarce resources? How can we make better energy grids, optimize those grids, produce better materials uh, for enabling energy and batteries, uh, and, and many other materials. Quantum can, can help in all of these areas. And it's really about a hybrid world. So when we think about the quantum revolution and accelerating with quantum computing, I really want you to have that, you know, that model in mind. It's an accelerator. It's not going to be a standalone compute, right? It's not going to be a computer you bring to your office. It's not going to be a computer you should buy even. I want to encourage you to think about quantum computing as an accelerator that plugs in to our world's computer, right? To the cloud. It's going to come and enable a hybrid compute, just as we think about GPUs or FPGAs, right? Already today, we just heard a lot about AI capabilities and innovation in machine learning. With that, right, we're learning how to accelerate those applications by using many types of compute together. Quantum will be one of those resources at your fingertips, and it is already today, right? This is about hybrid computing and acceleration by using many types of compute. And, and the key is identifying what problem, right? What piece of my algorithm, what piece of my computation should I send to that quantum accelerator, right? It's good at a few things, but not everything. So that's what I also want to introduce to all of you today. The other key I want to raise uh, before jumping into the application areas, when we think about useful applications, we think about that practical quantum advantage that's going to come you know, for real world valuable applications, we do need fault tolerance. We need a quantum computing system, a quantum machine that's going to be protected against errors. We need that 
quantum accelerator, that quantum machine to be able to scale to a million qubits and beyond. And I want to point out where we are today in terms of that quantum machine. So here I'm plotting an error rate on the x-axis versus a number of qubits on the y-axis. And these various lines, these plots, are where we need to get to. This is actually a plot of, of, of what's required to achieve a fault-tolerant quantum machine. Uh, that has a hundred a uh, hundred qubits that we call logical qubits. These are the qubits that would appear at the at the algorithm level, right? The user program level. The systems we have today sit in the lower right of this graph. They have, you know, somewhat small numbers of qubits. They have qubits, but they're small numbers, right? We're not yet to a hundred qubits, not yet to a thousand qubits. And we also have systems um, with that. Those systems have error rates that are not um, not quite good enough yet to bring us to this fault tolerant era of quantum machine. So you can see that there really is a gap, right? There's a gap between the hardware systems we're devising today and where we need to get to to run the software we want, right? The applications we want. So important that we close that gap and continue to improve the hardware, but also improve the ways we can protect that hardware and improve the algorithms and the applications uh, that we want to run on this quantum machine. So want to note that gap. Now what's exciting though, and what all of you probably know, is that often Right? Often we can outpace Moore's law. So when we look at, say, the development of a hardware device, right, um, we can actually outpace that if we have algorithmic improvements. And that's where closing that gap comes. The ability to close that gap quickly uh, is going to come from improvements on both sides. So we need to improve both the quantum computing hardware as well as make algorithmic advances. And here this is plotting, you know, the year versus the, the performance of, say, the hardware, right? versus software. This is for an Ising model simulation, where Ising model simulations, the improvements in the algorithms far outpace Moore's law. Um, so I think there's a lot of hope for closing that gap by making improvements in the quantum algorithms, understanding the applications we should be going after with quantum computers while simultaneously improving that hardware and bringing it together. So I'm not going to focus on the quantum hardware today. I want to focus more on the application space. You know, what develop, developments do we need to have impact from quantum acceleration? We need practical quantum advantage. We need to know what that means, and we need to know what's required to achieve practical quantum advantage. We need scientific and industrial applications that are going to bring about real value. And we need a vibrant and diverse ecosystem from which to develop these applications and collaborate together to bring about even more innovation. I want to start with practical quantum advantage. What is practical quantum advantage? Well, what it's about is solving a problem that's useful, right? Useful for either science or industry, where we have a faster or better solution than any known classical algorithm can produce on the best classical computer. So that might be running on the, you know, on the world's fastest supercomputer, running the best algorithms in that, in that format, or running on the cloud, right? HPC environment or, or heterogeneous cloud. We have to, per, you know, we have to really compare against that gold standard and bring the best in class forward from the classical perspective and then compare it to what would, will occur on a scaled quantum computer. When we look across you know, all of the proposals and all of right, these news articles you've seen, right, there is a maze of proposed ab applications. And in fact, there's a zoo of quantum algorithms maintained by Stephen Jordan on my team, uh, where he, you can go, go to this quantumalgorithmzoo.org, you can see all the quantum algorithms that have been invented uh, in the last few decades. And there's an exciting set of algorithms there. And the question is, is you know, what areas are they actually going to have practical quantum advantage? You know, where will it actually have quantum, practical quantum advantage? Because the reality is, while we have really beautiful algorithms on paper and we can show speed ups, when we pull those through a system and run them on an actual device, right, which we still have to scale up, but as we analyze that, Right? If we take a given quantum architecture and say, how many qubits are going to be required? How long is this going to take uh, when we actually run this algorithm through and, and try to program it and optimize it, compile it, map it to the hardware? It turns out that many of these applications aren't going to be sped up 
by a quantum computer. And so we need to identify those that will. So quantum speed up is the foundation, right? You have this beautiful complexity result, you have this new algorithm, that's fantastic. But it's the foundation, right? We need more than just the complexity result to show us a real practical quantum advantage. So on this, right, I'm mapping the problem size versus, say, the time. And we're, what we're looking for is a crossover time that's reasonable. That quantum advantage, that quantum speed up needs to be had at a crossover point that's not too long, right? 10,000 year crossover point is not going to be practical. We need a crossover time that's really around a few weeks, right? I think many of us who have worked, say, in machine learning or other applications, right, you're running a simulation, you're running a, a computational experiment, you're, you're going to wait a few weeks, maybe a month, right? But waiting much longer than that is not really practical. So we, we need to do better, right? We need to really, really map it to a few weeks. So when we take that few weeks as the goal, right, or a month as a goal, right, we want to be able to show a speed up where we get a result within a month from the quantum computer. You know, which, which quantum applications are going are gonna to see that? When can we outperform today's classical computer? So let's take, you know, let's take a comparison. Um, take a GPU. Uh, so today's classical chip, let's take something similar to the NVIDIA A100 GPU. On that, you have about 54 billion transistors. You have, uh, you know, 0.7 nanosecond cycle time. And then let's compare that to a, you know, tomorrow's quantum computer, right? So a quantum computer that has 10,000 logical qubits, which has not been, you know, has not yet been engineered or built, um, and a 10 uh, microsecond logical cycle time. Now, which applications, you know, what are, what are the characteristics, what are the attributes that we'll be able to, see, for which we'll be able to see the speed up coming from tomorrow's quantum computer? Now, the first thing is, you know, you, you may think, well, quantum computers will help solve big data problems. And so let's see, if we take a big data problem and map it to these two chips, what happens? Well, it turns out quantum computers are actually really slow at reading data, right? So today's classical, uh, classical chip, you're reading at, at about 10,000 gigabits a second. But tomorrow's quantum computer is going to read more like at one gigabit a second, right? Several of orders of magnitude slower. And so quantum computers will not excel at big data problems. It's not going to be, you know, the, the method of choice for improving database search or any search related problem for that matter. You're not going to try to solve an unstructured linear system problem on a quantum computer. Any data intensive problem is going to face this challenge, right? This slowdown um, of reading in all that data onto the quantum computer. And additionally, it's going to require an immense number of qubits. And we know that qubits are a scarce resource today, and they will continue to be so, you know, for, for, for a long period to come. So instead, we need to look at problems where they those problems focus on small small amounts of data, but have big compute. So I think of it a little bit little bit like a two way funnel, right? You have this 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 small funnel into the quantum computer, then you have this big compute capability, and then you actually also have a small funnel out on the on the readout side when you when you finally get the answer back from the quantum computer. So you need you know small input data large compute, and then you actually need to just ask the computer for a small amount of output data as well. The other thing you may have heard is that quantum computers are faster than classical computers, because after all, they can explore exponentially many options simultaneously, right? Once you're in this big compute, you have this exponential uh, capability. Well, let's look at the comparison. Turns out quantum computers need fewer operations. Right? We find that even from the, the, these beautiful complexity results on quantum algorithms. You can show that you require fewer operations. However, each operation is tens of orders of magnitude slower. Right, Many orders of magnitude slower. So if we take the GPU versus the, the quantum computer again, let's take you know, a logic operation. Think of it as like an AND gate, an OR gate. Um, in, in quantum computing, we think of something called the Toffoli gate or reversible computing as well. For those logic, you know, core logic operations on a GPU, you're looking at taking about five petaops a second. 
uh, to run that logic operation. On the quantum computer, you need it takes more like two mega ops a second. So it's it's remarkably slower in terms of its its clock rate, its operation speed. Similarly, if you look at 16-bit floating point operations uh, on, on a GPU, you're looking at around 300 teraops a second to do a 16-bit floating point op, uh, you know, say a multiply add. On the quantum computer, you're looking at seven kiloops a second to do something equivalent to a multiply add. So it is indeed slower, which means we need that many fewer operations in that quantum algorithm to have a crossover point that's going to be within that month time frame. So it turns out if you analyze this, what you find is you need a super quadratic speed up for a practical crossover time. So a quadratic speed up, which is what we have with say search, is not enough. If we look at how many operations we can actually afford in a quantum algorithm in order to have this reasonable crossover time of say you know, two weeks or 10 to the six seconds, with a quadratic speed up, we can only afford 71 logic operations. That's just not enough to do something really practical. And when you look at floating op point operations, you, you won't even be able to complete one. Now, if you have a cubic speed up, the story is different. And of course, if you have a cortex speed up or beyond, it's even better. Uh, so if you have a cubic speed up, you can have 13 million logic operations within that Oracle call and still see it as speed up within two weeks. For the floating point operations, you can achieve, you know, you can handle 21,000 and still have a good, you know, a good crossover time. So the quantum speed up is real. So this means we have to find super quadratic speed ups. And this is where ideally we have an exponential speed up for the quantum algorithm, because then we know we'll retain it as we map it down to the hardware. So I hope this gives some insight, right? The key is find problems where you have small amounts of data coming in, you have big compute need, and then ideally you also have small amounts of data that you would want to read out for the solution. So the practical quantum algorithms are in, you know, going to require what I just said, small data, big compute problems, super quadratic speedups, and quantum computers that have upwards of a million qubits in the physical system. So where do we find these applications? What are we going to run? What are we going to quantum accelerate? So let's talk about the scientific industrial applications. It turns out we have super quadratic speedups for computational chemistry. And on Earth Day, this is a great, you know, great thing to talk about. This is where we can really look to have, you know, better uh, sustainability solutions coming from improved technology, right? Impl improved compute like a quantum accelerator. So on this plot, what I'm showing is um, on, on the x-axis, we have spin orbitals. Think of this as a measure of the size of a chemistry problem. Uh, you know, this, is a, this is a measure of the size of the molecule. And then I'm, I'm graphing this versus time to solution. Now, there's a lot on this plot, so let's, let's step through it. The goal of this simulation, what I want to do is I want to understand the ground state energy uh, for, for a given uh, molecule. And it turns out, you know, even a decade ago, we had a quantum algorithm that gave a really nice result on this. And in fact, a, a super quadratic, you know, even exponential speed up uh, for this problem. If I want to find the ground state energy for certain molecules, um, uh, certain molecules, on a classical computer, you're looking at an intractable, it's an intractable problem, right? It's longer than the lifetime of the universe to find the solution for, for certain molecules. On a quantum computer, we knew that it was polynomial time. This algorithm had this beautiful polynomial result. And what we did um, several years back in, in 2013 is we, we programmed this algorithm. We used our, our tools to program the algorithm and determine what's the degree of the polynomial, what's the runtime going to look like. Well, as all of you know, it's really important to look at the degree of the polynomial. Um, while it's a polynomial runtime compared to exponential in the classical case, um, it turns out that for molecules of interest, say this iron, uh, for example, an iron molybdenum complex uh, that exists in the soil, 
uh, to help with nitrogen fixation, which is key for fertilizer production. Um, it turns out you're looking at 24 billion years. So if you look in the upper right here, we have this 24 billion years uh, runtime to find the ground state energy for this molecule. Now, over the past almost decade now, we've been able to improve this algorithm by studying what it looks like when you program it, and then also studying it from the theoretical perspective and improving the bounds. Uh, and by running it in code, right, in our simulators, uh, we were able to see that the scaling of the algorithm in practice didn't match the scaling of the theory. And by seeing this gap, right, by using tools, programming the algorithm, uh, and then and improving the bounds, we were able to close this gap over a series of improvements to the algorithm. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier, right? Often algorithmic improvements outpace Moore's law, outpace the hardware improvements. And so what's, what's beautiful about this result is that we can take down that runtime from 24 billion years down to something that is a matter of minutes. And you might be wondering, why is this problem interesting, right? It's interesting because this means that we can now do what we call simulation of a physical system, say in the case of chemistry or material science, and accelerate that problem uh, and, and time to solution with a quantum computer. This problem is not possible to solve to high accuracy with classical computers in many cases for many molecules. So by closing that gap, this is a great application, uh, both scientific and industrial and commercial, uh, for quantum accelerators. And being Earth Day, um, one of the applications that then emerges is the ability to help predict the efficiency of a catalyst that would help us remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. Right, so the problem of carbon fixation. Uh, this remains a challenging problem. Uh, we want to study that reaction. We want to find a catalyst, an efficient catalyst that enables us to take carbon dioxide, save, you know, save from our atmosphere and convert it to methanol. And we want this conversion to be more energy efficient. We need to understand those reaction rates. And the typical way we do this is we, we supply a catalyst. So, for example, a ruthenium catalyst. With ruthenium as the catalyst, right, you take in some um, hydrogen and carbon dioxide in and produce methanol and water out. And we want this ruthenium catalyst to not only play a role once, but to play a role many times, right? You want that reaction to continue to be efficient and you want ruthenium to be able to be reused. You don't want it destroyed in that production of methanol. This is a very challenging problem and we have not solved it in our world yet. And part of the challenge comes from the fact that there is a step in this computation that is very hard to compute classically. We cannot get accurate enough solutions from our supercomputers, right, from our HPC environments. So on this, uh, in this picture, all of the blue boxes are classical pieces of the computation. And the green box is the box that we can hope to solve better using a quantum computer. So there's another takeaway that you should, you know, that you should extract from this slide, which is, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, quantum computing is really hybrid computing. We need not only the quantum computer here, we also need very, very large scale classical compute right in the pipeline and the feedback loop of this algorithm to make progress on identifying a, ca a catalyst that could help, for example, with ca the carbon fixation reaction. So quantum computing plays the role in calculating this energy, right? Quantum computing can help us calculate an accurate energy, in particular when quantum correlations are key within a reaction. Now, bringing it all together, right, what we've been able to do is take this quantum algorithm for calculating that energy and reduce it by 10 orders of magnitude over the last several years. And I showed earlier how we did that with a mix of programming as well as theory. And, uh, you know, recently we've applied this to the case of carbon fixation, where we can show that once we have a quantum computer with enough qubits, right, and that's fault tolerant, right, it's error corrected, um, then we can, we can deliver with a month runtime running on 5,000 logical qubits and a cycle time of 10 microseconds with 5,000 logical qubits in a month runtime, we can understand and produce these energies that would unlock the capability to do computational catalysis uh, for these very challenging problems, these hard molecules. 
So quantum computers will help accelerate the search for catalysts, right? In that process today, again, it's the quantum correlations in those reactions, right, between the catalyst and the molecule that are preventing our accurate predictions, right? So it's very hard to do this in advance. It's hard to do it computationally. We often have to go to the lab, produce that catalyst and study it. With industrial quantum computers, we'll be able to help accurately predict the properties of those catalysts and then in turn enable the uh, opportunity to industrially produce catalysts that will help with carbon fixation, nitrogen fixation, you know, and other, other catalytic chemical reaction problems. And again, quantum algorithms will also uh, impact areas where we, we're, where we see other superquadratic speedups, right? Other big compute problems. So another area where we think about big compute is in optimization. Right, optimization is is prevalent all over the world. Right, it covers everything from circuit fault diagnosis, you know, to different applications in oil and gas, in materials discovery, signal processing. Right, all over, all the way over to logistics. Right, uh, you look at traffic optimization um, and and ride sharing. All of these use optimization uh, algorithms at their core. Now, it turns out there is a quantum speed up for optimization, right? Within an optimization algorithm, you typically have a classical random walk. And if we replace this classical random walk with the quantum walk, right? So just replace that part of the, the compute, uh, we get a quadratic speed up. Now, you'll, you're probably asking, Krista, why are you presenting this problem? We just talked about quadratic speed ups not being enough. Well, it turns out that we have a, um, some recent results showing that in, in cases of heuristics, we believe that you will achieve a super quadratic speed up with certain heuristics that we present in this paper. But with those heuristics, for certain applications of optimization, uh, we expect that you might get super quadratic speed ups. And so this could be another very compelling area for quantum computing uh, to have an impact. But what's really exciting is in studying this problem, right? studying the quantum the quantum algorithm for optimization we've identified that you can emulate some of the behavior of quantum algorithms classically and that means you can have quantum impact today right you can deploy those algorithms today on classical compute and see some of the speed ups uh, part way to the speed ups you expect from a quantum computer once it's once it's available and of the scale required for these types of problems now, I do want to point out the quantum computer that will enable a speed up for optimization is even larger than the quantum computer that will enable the speed up for chemistry and material science. So we can look at quantum inspired optimization, right? Here, what we can do is we can, we can come up with solutions that emulate some of the aspects of quantum mechanics on classical hardware in classical algorithms, and we can deploy those already today. And then we can look to have additional speed up when we have our scaled quantum system available for quantum acceleration. So in these cases, um, typically classically, we, we have to climb over, right? We have to have these, we have these thermal jumps and we have to climb up and over the, you know, the mountains in our cost function landscape. Quantumly, right, with a, with a quantum computer uh, and by quantum mechanics, you can actually tunnel, right? You can tunnel through these mountains and so you can have a faster convergence rate to those minima. Now with quantum inspired, we're doing something in between, right? We're emulating some of the behavior of the quantum tunneling and we can achieve something that's faster than the convergence rate of the thermal jump uh, approach, right? Say a quantum annealing or a simulated annealing approach. And we can do something that's a simulated quantum annealing approach, right? We can, we can do something in between and achieve uh, improvements. And again, these run on classical hardware. So we've applied these techniques, these quantum solutions uh, that are running on classical hardware to several different problems. So I wanna highlight two. The first is work with Case Western Reserve University. And what we've been able to do is take these algorithms and customize an optimization approach uh, to MRI pulse sequence optimization. So, you know, if you've ever been in an MRI, you know that you know, you go into the into the machine and you hear these really loud pulses. Those loud pulses um, is exactly the sequence that we've worked to improve here, right? You have these really loud pulses and they can take quite a long time, right? Sometimes you're in that machine for, uh, you know, for half an hour, maybe even more. 
With our algorithms, we've been able to, uh, we can have scan speeds that are three times faster, or alternatively, we can achieve better image quality for the same scan time. Now, what this unlocks is the ability to detect for example, if a chemotherapy treatment is working or not on the brain early, right? You can detect, you have better tissue, um, uh, tissue uh, detection accuracy, enabling you to know if a given treatment uh, is actually advancing progress, right? And having an impact on the patient. It also means that you might be able, you know, that you can now uh, not have to sedate, for example, a child who's going into an MRI because the MRI is that much faster. And it also, of course, enables greater throughput through the MRI machine. But this is a great step forward uh, in terms of uh, medical diagnostics, right? And applying these algorithms to the medical and health industry for, for really critical improvements. Similarly, we can take our optimization solutions and we can apply them, for example, to traffic congestion. So in work with Ford, we have worked on traffic optimization. And so on the right, you can see a simulation here of traffic in the, in the greater Seattle area, applying this optimization algorithm uh, to, see, uh, to see these improvements. And overall, we've been able to reduce commute time by 8% and improve overall traffic congestion by 73%. So those are just two applications of these quantum inspired solutions. Now to bring all of this, all of this forward, of course, we also need a very vibrant and a very diverse ecosystem. And uh, before jumping into the, the platform, you know, what's most, what's really at the core of that diversity are people, right? We need diverse people collaborating and innovating in this space to bring forward new ideas, new solutions, and even more applications that will have practical quantum advantage. So while we have made steps forward with regard to diversity, we still have a long way to go. In addition, we need diversity of role, right? Within this quantum ecosystem, right? And, and to, really, to really make progress towards a quantum revolution, we need many, many different skill sets. So we need diversity of people and also diversity of skill. In 1994, when Shor developed his quantum algorithm for factoring, right, which in turn is uh, enables the breaking of one of our mainstays of e-commerce, right, it enables cracking RSA, uh, the RSA uh, uh, crypto system, right. If you roll back to 1994, much of the work in quantum computing was done uh, by mathematicians, right, or or physicists, and so you really had, you know, one type of profession. Uh, and over time, that has grown and changed. The, the, the environment and the landscape has, has, has really diversified because now we're approaching the need to produce a quantum machine. We have to identify applications with practical quantum advantage. Uh, and so we need domain expertise working hand in hand with quantum algorithm and quantum, uh, quantum algorithm experts and quantum developers. And so over time, we've been able to uh, continue to diversify the, the different skills. Um, but as we continue to work to bring this technology forward, right, to the cloud, uh, to enterprises, developers, academics, researchers all over the globe, we need to continue to diversify who's involved um, and, and the, you know, the people uh, that are around the table helping to innovate to bring about the quantum revolution. And that, you know, diversity of thought really comes with access, right? We need to open up access, right? Democratize quantum, uh, quantum computing uh, and scale that access through the development of platforms, uh, solutions, services, and tools, right? We really want to empower people with this ability to quantum accelerate uh, their jobs and their problems. And at, so at Microsoft, what we've done is we have, we have, um, we have brought forward Azure Quantum, right? This is really a full stack cloud ecosystem that it enables quantum impact today 
and enables you to prepare and develop for quantum today to prepare for that scaled, uh, scaled quantum accelerator that's coming to the cloud. With Azure Quantum, we you can target, right? You can write programs and target solutions in optimization, machine learning, quantum simulation, which impacts chemistry and material science, as I as I spoke about, and also look at uh, cryptanalysis. It brings forward a quantum-focused programming language called Q Sharp and also a development kit, the Quantum Development Kit, or QDK as we call it, uh, that brings forward lots of the tools, right? It's embedded in Visual Studio, VS Code, and your, you know, all of your favorite uh, IDEs, brings forward debugging capabilities, tracing and profiling capabilities, uh, and really makes it easier to start your quantum development today. We've also introduced QIR. This is a quantum intermediate representation that really serves as, as a, a representation that enables mapping your program to many backend hardware, uh, hardware providers, as well as the ability to bring forward multiple languages um, and map those to the hardware as well. Uh, all of those, Q -sharp and QIR, are both open source that we can really encourage community contribution. We also bring forward quantum solutions. So I mentioned some of the optimization solutions that we've applied, for example, to the case of MRI sequence optimization and traffic optimization. But with Azure Quantum, we bring forward pre-built solutions, uh, both from, from our own team at Microsoft and also from the teams at OneCubit and Toshiba, so that you have at your fingertips uh, these solutions, right, ready to deploy in your, uh, for your, on your different problems. But what's exciting is we also have simulators and resource estimators where you can take your quantum program and you can run it uh, at a small scale, right, on a small instance in simulation uh, and also run it at a larger scale through the resource estimator to understand the types of things I pointed out earlier, right? How many qubits will this quantum algorithm require? Uh, how, how long will it take to run, right? Does it deliver a practical quantum advantage? And when I spoke about chemistry, right, bringing down the runtimes from 24 billion years to minutes, it's, it was with these tools that we were able to develop that understanding and bring forward new techniques within those algorithms to bring those runtimes down. This is absolutely critical work for us to see that quantum revolution realized. Now you can then, uh, with a click of a button, right, deploy that same code on quantum hardware. And so you can, uh, you can deploy it um, in simulation, test it in simulation, debug, understand the resources, and then deploy it and run it on quantum hardware coming from three providers, IonQ and Honeywell, both IonTrap quantum computers, and also from QCI, which is a superconducting quantum computer uh, architecture. And we're also at Microsoft working on our own, uh, our own first party quantum machine. This is built from what we call topological qubits. And this is a type of uh, quantum architecture that promises more readily scaling to a million qubits and beyond, right? Really scaling towards those practical uh, quantum applications we see for our future. So with a more robust hardware, um, we believe that uh, we'll be able to deploy these chemistry al al algorithms in the future. Uh, but today you can run on these other three hardware providers and test and learn how to develop uh, for that quantum future. So with Azure Quantum, you have the benefit of solutions at your fingertips, and we have several, several different companies that have worked with us to bring about these benefits uh, for their own customers, right? With one qubit, they've been using these optimization solutions for pharmaceutical discovery. OTI Lumionics has been using it for materials design, namely in these organic LED compounds, working to better understand those compounds, which are in turn used for heads up displays. And then JIJ has used this for traffic light optimization, you know, looking how to, how to optimize for, uh, traffic light signaling um, so that you can reduce the amount of idling time at a stoplight, right? In turn, enabling us uh, to really help with sustainability um, and, and look at combating, you know, emissions uh, on our planet. 
With Azure Quantum, you can also learn to develop practical quantum applications. And what's exciting is we have a partnership with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and NW Chem, where we're bringing together the tools to do the type of chemistry modeling I spoke about, right? As I mentioned, these algorithms are hybrid. You need the best-in-class classical tools working in conjunction with the best-in-class quantum tools uh, to bring forward a solution. It's a very tight feedback loop between the classical and the quantum compute uh, that will enable these revolutionary solutions to come about. And in our quantum development kit, we have brought forward libraries um, that bring together these tools. Uh, we have chemistry li libraries, numerics libraries that enable you to begin developing this pipeline uh, for these types of applications. And then you can run that on hardware, right? Now, of course, at a small scale today, right? On your simulator, uh, with a simulator, you can run, uh, you know, as much as you can fit on your on your client machine, uh, and then around, you know, 40-ish, uh, upwards of 40 qubits in the cloud. Um, because after all, every additional qubit you wish to simulate, you need double the classical memory to do so. Um, so, so that's a substantial amount of memory, right, you need, and this is why we really want a quantum computer. And then you can run that same program on hardware. And so what's shown here is running on the IonQ ion trap device. Um, here, what we're, ma what we're understanding is a chemistry problem. You want to understand the ground state energy uh, between uh, two hydrogen atoms. And so on the x-axis, this is plotting uh, the bond length, right, the distance between those hydrogen atoms. And then what you want to calculate on the quantum computer is that energy, uh, energy per atom. So you want to understand, say, the ground state energy um, or some excite, in some cases uh, not shown here, but you might want to understand excited state dynamics as well. And so here, uh, the black, now in this case, you can run this fully classically. So the black line rec represents the, the result, um, the, the true result you should expect. Uh, this is a small problem, of course. And then you can see in the turquoise uh, bullet there, that's ion, the INQ simulator result, which, should, which indeed perfectly pairs with the, the true classical, you know, the true result. Um, and then the other runs are several different runs on different versions of the INQ hardware running on two and four qubit instances. And you can see that they vary a little bit. Um, but what's so exciting is that you're running a real algorithm on real quantum hardware. Uh, and what and how we did this was IonQ worked, um, sorry, one qubit worked with Dow Chemical. Dow was interested in running this problem and, and other such problems on the quantum hardware. They worked with one qubit to write that program in Azure Quantum in our Q-sharp programming language, then deployed it through Azure Quantum uh, to run on the IonQ device. We're working with many, uh, many partners, customers, and uh, people around the world to bring about this technology. So what we know is that we can't do it alone. We need to partner and have a really gl a global, uh, global team, if you will, right? Uh, a global community working to innovate in this space. And so I've mentioned some of those partners and customers today, and we also have an extensive uh, extensive set of collaborations with universities worldwide, uh, working both on, on innovating in this space, but also bringing about workforce development, right? How are we going to train and, and teach and educate the next generation of quantum mechanics? Um, and that's, that's, I think it's very exciting to think about um, how we encourage more participation uh, in, in quantum computing. And I want to close in in with a with a quote from Bill Gates, right? Uh, what he says is, "We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, and underestimate the change that will occur in the next ten. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction." So I, what I want to encourage all of you to do is, you know, jump in, try out quantum development, right? This will be groundbreaking. This is going to create incredible change in how we think about computing, what we're able to compute, how we think about that world's computer, right? What type of acceleration it's going to bring forward. But we can't do it alone. 
I'm asking all of you to join us in this action, right? Join us in identifying what problems can we accelerate with a quantum machine, right? Join us in innovating so that we can close that gap as I talked about, right? Bring down the cost of the quantum algorithms, bring up the capability of the quantum devices and bring them into that fault tolerant age. So I hope you join me as we march along the journey uh, to, the, to this quantum revolution. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll end there for questions. Uh, um, Krista, thanks very much. I think uh, uh, we all, maybe not all, but uh, most of the people actually learned a lot, I guess, from this talk because <laughs> it's intensive, yeah. So I have a couple of questions and some, some of the other questions are coming, right? So maybe, um, maybe questions might seem stupid, but still I will ask them. So, uh, so is a, uh, What's the transition from a classical programmer into somebody which could call himself as a quantum programmer? Uh, is this uh, important mindset change or not so big? So could you comment on this? Yes, definitely. So there are aspects where it is a, you know, a bigger paradigm shift than than others, right? Naturally, you have a very different instruction set at your fingertips, right? The types and the language are different. Um, but as I mentioned, quantum computers are hybrid. So when you think about your quantum code, your quantum program, it's not just quantum code, right? A lot of it is classical code. So you can bring to bear, you know, your knowledge of programming um, and, and jump in and then learn, you know, learn how to integrate in. In, uh, that quantum programming capability. I think some of the keys are understanding what are the tools at your fingertips? How do you achieve quantum speed ups, right? What, what's key there? What's in the toolbox? And what we think about uh, what's key to achieving a quantum speed up is really bringing forward entanglement, quantum entanglement. So this is where we, we have a quantum state and we need to interact the qubits with each other in a way to produce a lot of entanglement, right? Such that they're all interconnected, if, we, if you will, right? They can't be described alone, right? And uh, solo. So you need a lot of quantum entanglement. And then you also take advantage of quantum interference. And I think this is one of the really key techniques. If you're going to start writing quantum algorithms, you need to understand quantum interference. How does it work in other algorithms? How can you, how can you create such interference in, this, in the problem, right, for the solution you want to produce? And what is interference, right? I mean, just as a, at an intuitive level, think about a like a, a, a pool, right? Uh, you have a pond or a pool of water and you, you touch it in one place and it creates ripples, right? It creates waves. And I'm sure many of you have done this or if you have kids, your kids have done this, right? And you click, you know, you put your finger on another side of the pool and now you have two sets of ripples. And what happens? Some of those ripples come together and their amplitude increases, right? They become bigger waves in the pond. Other ripples come together and they actually, um, they counteract each other, right? And so they go away, right? Or their amplitude decreases. This is what a quantum algorithm is designed. Like this is how you design a quantum algorithm, right? It's all about creating bigger amplitudes on the waves that encode the solution you want out and creating uh, no amplitude or a lower amplitude for the others. Because at the end of the quantum algorithm, what you do is you measure. And the measurement is a function of that amplitude, right? So you need high amplitude solutions uh, to get the right measurement out. Um, those are the ones that you're gonna measure with greater probability. Uh, so it's all about designing this, this kind of tide pool wave simulation, right? It's all about quantum interference. So that's something you need as a quantum, as a quantum programmer and developer uh, to, to understand. Now, the beauty is, is that, um, for example, in the QDK and, and with Q-sharp, we have extensive libraries where you can try to you know, plumb these together uh, to try try different approaches um, and lots of samples to play with. So, so definitely jump in, try it out, uh, you know, run it through the simulator and see how it behaves. I think it's a great way to also learn more about quantum mechanics. Thanks. This was really great uh, 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 explanation. Uh, what what one needs to uh, think about when when solving the problem. Uh, let me go to uh, two questions. So one by Ganesh, right? So uh, uh, maybe. Uh, 
and deep learning uh, could be used um, uh, to generate features really uh, on small data uh, as input to uh, quantum computers, right? So, uh, uh, which I would uh, rephrase in a way as well. So, represent uh, deep learning is really about representation learning, right? So, in, in principle, you create uh, more expressive features from the input features, right? So, this is one one extremely fundamental. Uh, property of <clears throat> deep learning uh, could you comment on this uh, could this be like uh, expressed in a proper way uh, through these ripple waves right, uh, which you uh, just uh, described yeah so the, there's maybe uh, for machine learning in general if we we bubble up just a bit before we talk about deep learning specifically i think you know for machine learning in general uh, when we're learning, if the data is quantum, so here's a challenge for everyone, right? Think think of a problem where the data could actually be quantum, right? Where can the data come to you as a quantum state already? I don't have to read it in. Then you don't have the problems I, I, I spoke about, right? If it's already in a quantum state, it's already encoded in qubits, uh, fantastic. Um, so, uh, you know, one question, if you think about generating data for the quantum computer, can you can you create an algorithm that's going to be, you know, compact and take advantage of interference and, and entanglement, as we discussed, um, and be represented as a function uh, in the quantum computer? And then you generate the data right there. You're generating it already as quantum data. That might be interesting. Um, so there's there's things about, you know, think about in terms of how you could how you could do that within the quantum computer. It's definitely the case. You could also then use classical techniques as Ganesh is outlining to produce a smaller data set that I then feed the quantum computer. Um, and, and that would be great, right? Anything where you have a small data set, the quantum computer has the potential uh, to have impact, but you got to check that practical quantum advantage, right? Check that your speed ups hold through um, and that you have more than a quadratic speed up, uh, ideally. Um, so, so I think that uh, in addition, we know that if you have quantum data, you can get an exponential speed up in machine learning, uh, a machine learning technique on a quantum computer. Um, so there, that's a really nice uh, potential, but we need to find the, the case where that data comes to you as quantum data. If the data is coming to you as classical, um, the other thing, in addition to thinking about how you would generate data and then feed a problem to the quantum computer is uh, the quantum computer might be able to serve as one of the one of the accelerators used to produce a feature, say, in your data or a feature in your training algorithm. It could also help you learn how to differentiate uh, between a good solution and a bad solution. You might call it periodically on just cases uh, right where you need to make a decision. Um, but I do think there's a lot that we don't yet understand with regard to these models and the role quantum computers could play. Um, because I do want to point out right now, we have a really, we have a challenging barrier or, you know, a challenging bar that we have to achieve. We have to prove everything mathematically. Like this, you know, this is hard, right? Um, often, and I worked in machine learning, you know, at Microsoft for, for many years, the algorithms we deployed, we couldn't prove much about. They're beautiful heuristics, right? But how did we test them? We tested them by running them. Mm -hmm. And we're not yet in the era where, where we can run some of these algorithms, but we're, we're getting there. Um, so so it, it'll be exciting. As, as the quantum devices grow, we'll be able to run these and test these heuristics and see where the quantum computer provides the best, the best uh, acceleration. And this is the next <clears throat> question by Mitya, basically in the, uh, the same line as you just uh, said. So the question is really, so um, are, um, uh, uh, let's say, potentials for this um, uh, hard problem? So are these potentials only being theoretically calculated or were they empirically um, uh, proven uh, through, let's say, experiments? Uh, so in a way, you answer that many of them are still on the theoretical side. Uh, but some are. Is, is this kind of yeah, yeah. So what's important to realize is our quantum computers today. For example, we have these quantum computers in Azure, as I mentioned, right? They're still of small scale. Um, it, it it is a wonderful step forward, but you will not yet get something that you can't get classically. Well, you'll get something different than you get classically from the quantum computer. But in terms of the solution and and the value to the problem, right? You're not going to get something yet uh, that you can't get classically, right, uh, in terms of that, say, commercial value or scientific value. So you're not going to get an answer that you can't um, can't get on a classical computer. Um, so 
so yes, we have run some of these algorithms, right? At the end, I showed this algorithm we ran on, on the IonQ uh, piece of hardware for calculating the distance between hydrogen atoms. And if you do an online search, you'll see that many different small instances have been run on quantum hardware uh, in many, you know, on many different types of devices, different architectures. Um, so indeed, we are running some of these. And 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 part of the idea there is, is can we develop some, you know, some new heuristics, some new intuition and understanding of how the quantum computer is behaving. Uh, because maybe the noise in the quantum computer does something a little different than we expect, and maybe it's not so bad, or maybe it is, right? We need to test this out. Um, so that's that's definitely happening. Most of these results were running in simulation, and mm -hmm. we are, uh, you know, in that case, we can run up to, you know, as I mentioned, around 40 qubits. Mm -hmm. um, and that also gives us an, a lot of information on the behavior mm -hmm. of the algorithm. And then we program it in the code, and we can resource estimate it fully at scale. And the kind of related question, right? So, uh, uh, would need the, the 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 concept or notion of the algorithmic complexity would would it need to be redefined for quantum uh, algorithms? I mean, we we all learned about this small o, big o notation, you know, all the yes. usual, right? So, uh, does this still apply to uh, these algorithms, or this needs to be like viewed from some entirely different angle? Yeah, wonderful. So, yes, we do. We need to define new complexity classes. Um, and this has been done. You know, the premier person to look up, if you're interested in this, is Scott Aronson. Scott maintains a beautiful um, kind of web page of all the different, uh, I think it's called the Complexity Zoo, if I recall correctly. Um, but his Complexity Zoo includes many of the quantum uh, quantum complexity classes that we look at here. So you'll hear things like uh, BQP, QMA, right? So we have quantum analogs of like MA, right? Uh, and so forth. And that's indeed what we prove. Um, and, you know, again, at, in speaking about those, right? A quantum algorithm is probabilistic, mm -hmm. so um, right the, these these complexity classes we look at it's a probability right it's it's the probability mm -hmm. of achieving the solution with a certain you know a certain probability of success. Um, so indeed, sometimes you have to re run your quantum algorithm several times, many times, mm -hmm. uh, to get the right solution. So yeah, definitely look up Scott Aronson. He also has a great blog uh, in, in case anyone's interested. Wonderful blog. You can learn a lot from with every post. Um, but he maintains a lot of these complexity classes and invents many of them. OK, this is very useful to know. Yeah, uh, with your introduction, I guess, uh, will be much easier to <laughs> uh, yeah. to check these pages. And maybe just the last question, since we, we are roughly about the time to, to end, right? Uh, so the, the last question is, uh, what are the main challenges today to build more powerful quantum hardware, right? So um, probably you would know. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I mentioned that we, with a quantum computer, we'll be able to get more accurate predictions for for simulation of physical systems. And, you know, one of those, I talked more about chemistry, but one of them is materials. And what we would love for a quantum computer is to have a room temperature superconductor, a high temperature superconductor. It turns out many of the architectures run at very cold environments, millikelvin temperatures, right, which is very near, absolutely zero. Um, so if we had a quantum computer, we could invent the next generation of quantum computer that doesn't have to be cold. But I mentioned this because this is this is one of the challenges, right? It's the materials. Uh, we have very exotic, you know, these architectures, um, while some use some of the materials that are closer to what we use in, in the case of silicon and transistors, uh, right, and classical compute technology. Um, in other cases, for example, what we're working on at Microsoft, we're doing something very different and we really have to understand the materials and how they interact. We're, we're, we're bringing a superconductor together with a semiconductor um, and you need a very, you know, you need an almost perfect interface between that superconductor and semiconductor. So we really do have a materials um, challenge in that to develop a quantum computer, we need very accurate, precise understanding of the materials science. Uh, and so once, you know, as we move through that, 
Uh, the key milestones or challenges along the path to a scaled quantum computer are going to include being able to bring fault tolerance to that machine. Um, so I briefly mentioned this in the beginning, but this requires quite a bit of resource overhead. Uh, so in order to make a quantum computer fault tolerant, uh, you need lots of additional qubits. This is actually why we're pursuing something called the topological qubit. We believe it will need less overhead than the other approaches. Uh, but you know, but in general, you need many physical qubits to represent that one qubit that's in your algorithm. And so a key challenge, a key milestone will be to show a logical, a logical qubit, right? Something that's many physical qubits put together, bound together into a quantum state that represents this logical qubit. And then from there, we're going to need to tile that out, right? We're going to have to integrate the system so that we have many logical qubits together working in concert. Um, and we need, you know, we need upwards of 100 to 200 logical qubits to do something scientifically interesting. And then, you know, um, you know, there and beyond for the commercial interest. Uh, so, so we have we have some really exciting engineering work ahead of us. Great, great answer. Uh, also, great explanation. I think um, no, uh, I think everybody's saying uh, also in the back channel that they learned a lot. And uh, uh, I mean, this is generally it's a, a web conference, right? So, uh, which means that uh, these are people which work with AI, knowledge uh, structures, semantics, and so on. Uh, but of course, lots of probabilistic AI as well. So, uh, but uh, you know, not every, not that everybody can uh, know everything. And th this was exactly the the lesson for uh, many people. Uh, so, uh, great talk. Uh, I think everybody's uh, very happy. Last talk of the day. Uh, Thank actually, you. La last keynote of the conference. Yeah, tomorrow we have just uh, one more panel um, in the European morning. And uh, uh, Krista, thanks again, right? Thank uh, you. Uh, and uh, everybody, uh, so uh, thanks uh, to attend uh, this session. Uh, and um, uh, good night from Ljubljana, from uh, Slovenia. Uh, good night. Thank Krista again. Goodbye. Good night. Great talk, Krista. Thank you.